I, I showed you the must-know oral lesions, all those little lists so that you can hone down your diagnosis to a small group of entities and from there you can study each one and see which fits best your patient. But there is a, a, a set of cases that I put together for our students to practice with and uh, they're available to you. I just call them 96 virtual cases. I suppose um, we can just look through one group to illustrate what, uh, how it works. Uh, this is the list of all the ulcers that uh, I put together and blisters. These are all pictures taken exactly from the, the must-know oral lesions. So when you find the proper diagnosis, you'll see that's, it, that's the exact picture of your case. I don't give you the diagnosis ahead of time because I don't want to make it too easy for you, but uh, you can know that you got the proper diagnosis because you will have the exact picture. And this is what the cases look like. You can always get back to the first page or the index of cases from any case. They all have a picture. They all have, uh, there's something wrong with the USB drive, by the way, that uh, is interfering with my computer now. But at any rate, there, there's a picture, there's a code number so that I can pick out cases uh, when I use these with uh, students. Brief history, I try not to be very extensive in the history because I want you to use your minds and try to figure out what questions to ask. And these are designed for a faculty member to stand in front, or another student, to stand in front and sort of pretend that they are this patient and ask, answer questions. And if I have more than one picture, there's a little note up here, click anywhere to see the next, which is a radiograph. And uh, then the next slide is histology, but there really is very little histology in this whole set. And the other thing that uh, just is a work in progress that I think is handy to know about anyway, I don't know what to call this, so I just started years ago calling it the little book of lists, and I handed it out as a handout, a written, printed handout to my students, and I've been doing that for many years. But uh, recently I've made it one of these hyperlink handouts, and eventually it will be on the oralpath.com website. These are all those little things that you can never keep in mind and can't really find when you do a lit review. They're not really listed as such in textbooks. If you want to know what drugs produce pigmentation, these are the drugs uh, that will do that. And uh, there's usually, a, if there's a second list uh, page to look to at, this will show you. And then here it says next uh, gray-black lesions. And here's a list of those things that will produce that. If you want to see, um, for example, I'm going to talk about little vesicles this morning, but if you want to see what ulcers there are that uh, do not heal chronic ulcers, here's a list of those. And it's just a little help so that you at least have a starting point to help you find um, uh, the proper diagnosis for your patient. This, uh, the topic is one that is uh, kind of confusing and in a way kind of simple because there aren't very many things that produce small blisters in the oral cavity. I'm an oral pathologist. I told you I've seen many patients with oral medicine type lesions, probably in a lifetime 15 to 20,000 individuals with some problems in the mouth that other dentists and physicians couldn't figure out. And so uh, my experience is pretty vast in this area, but this is something that I seldom have seen, maybe a couple hundred patients in my experience. And that's because I think the general dentists and even some of the specialists, periodontists in particular, are uh, fairly well attuned to this kind of thing. And as I mentioned yesterday, that means it's your responsibility. You're the one who's going to make the diagnosis. Most of these uh, are viral diseases usually by the time you culture a virus and get a proper diagnosis, it is gone. The, the patient's better and the patient is moving on to some other part of his or her life. So uh, it really is almost never properly diagnosed. And the diagnosis then becomes your clinical impression. And uh, you should have an idea, that's why I put them all together in one topic, uh, of what differences are between the various types of viruses. I just call them little bubbles, and uh, there are a few other things that produce little bubbles, but uh, I'll just briefly uh, touch on those. 
if we're going to talk about uh, ulcers and blisters, this is really the group of category, or this is the category that we're talking about. When we have ulcers, uh, ulcers, I think, are, are best established as either an acute, short-term, two, three weeks, or chronic, lasting more than that. And unfortunately, many of the chronic ulcers do not have pain associated with them. And many of them look a lot like squamous cell carcinoma. So the chronic ulcers are almost always the kind of thing that, as I mentioned yesterday, you have to biopsy. It just is, you have to find a diagnosis somehow. And usually that is going to be by biopsy. It's a confusing group of things. I'm not going to talk about them, but uh, you should at least be aware of the fact when you get an ulcer in one of your patients, that's the first question you ask. The first thing you determine is how long has that been going on? And then the second is how painful it is. If it is exquisitely painful, but it's been there for three weeks, then you can't call it a cancer because it's, number one, too short a duration. Number two, cancer doesn't hurt that much until well beyond the first year of infiltration and invasion. So you've at least eliminated a major problem in your mind, and uh, I think that's a big help. So the pain, the symptoms are definitely a big part of it. But too often, at least my students, they jump on the pain first and they don't even ask how long something has been going on. Well, the vesicles will be what I'm going to talk about. The blisters, uh, there are large blisters, such as we see with pemphigoid and pemphigus. I'm not going to get into those. They're pretty uncommon. We get maybe one or two biopsies of large blister diseases every week in our biopsy service. But that's because we have an immunofluorescence lab. And there are only three immunofluorescence labs in the U.S. in dental schools, and we happen to have one of them. So we get them sent from uh, all over. And these diseases most often need an immunofluorescence, a microscope to make a diagnosis. Since the bisphosphonates uh, for osteoporosis and for metastatic cancer and for multiple myeloma, since they have uh, hit the market back in the uh, early 80s, late 70s, and for the cancer-related drugs, especially in the early 90s, we have seen some very serious uh, problems. With exposed bone, uh, it is almost, well, it has become routine. When this first uh, hit America back in 2003, 2002, everybody was afraid. They knew not what to do. Uh, same thing happened in the early 1980s with AIDS. No dentist, even oral surgeons, would not treat anybody with HIV. And uh, we went through a period of that in our country. I don't know about Guatemala, but in our country, that lasted about four or five years. Um, and no dentist would treat. They wouldn't even do routine caries control and, and uh, restorative procedures on somebody because they were worried that uh, the site of the injection would break down and they'd have exposed bone. And keep in mind, we are a country with many lawyers. <laughs> and uh, dentists don't want to do things. It's unfortunate they become too cautious. But that's over now. And now uh, we've learned to live with the exposed bone and we really kind of ignore the bone and treat the surrounding soft tissue. And uh, that's been heartening to see. I don't know of any dentist in Houston now that would not take somebody who is on bisphosphonates into their practice. And that's a long way from where we were just uh, four or five years ago. So that's a, a very unique thing as well. Under this category, I had to put pits and fissures, sort of those developmental anomalies somewhere, and that seemed to fit okay here. So that's what we've got. If we look at the difference between a bullus and a vesicle, by, by our definition, at least in our country, we reserve the word bulla or bullus lesion for large lesions. And technically, that means greater than about four millimeters in size. If it's less than that, then we call it a vesicle, and uh, those are usually the viral lesions in the mouth. So let's look at the list of these things. Uh, you can see they're virtually all viral. We have a couple of look-alike lesions. I don't know uh, about in Guatemala, you have a little more pigment in your skin than I have. Uh, my Scandinavian or Swedish background gives me almost no pigment. And when I go in the sun, I burn instead of get tan. But uh, I have had uh, quite a few young people, almost, well, virtually always young people. Maybe they're the ones who go in the sun. 
but they go from uh, Minnesota or New York City to Florida during spring break and by the second day their lower lip is just full of blisters and pustules and it's very painful and it looks just like a, a herpes simplex lesion but it does not go away after two weeks and uh, usually I tell my students if you have a herpes lesion and it's still there after two weeks you should worry about the immune system and if it's still there after three weeks then you should get that patient to a physician to have the immune system evaluated because that may be the first sign of leukemia, first sign of AIDS. Uh, so that's kind of an important signal. But this is the exception. Uh, sun poisoning only hits the lower lip, seems to not really affect the skin so much as a vermilion border, and uh, there really is no good treatment. So you give steroids instead of trying to keep it dry the way you would with a herpes simplex or even try some antivirals. So that's one of the look-alike lesions. And impetigo is, uh, I think of that as a great fooler. I've, I've actually been fooled three times in my life, uh, calling something herpes simplex uh, labialis when in fact it was a bacterial infection, impetigo. There are some of those that, that have fairly good vesicles as uh, part of their, their standard uh, presentation. But like the herpes simplex, or like the sun poisoning, uh, this is on the skin and it lasts for a long time. So sun poisoning is on the vermilion border, the impetigo is on the skin just outside the vermilion border. So there are, I'll, I think I'll show some pictures of that uh, later on. And then there are some things that are pseudovesicles. Um, I just uh, published a paper last month, it came, well two months ago it came out. It's a new entity that all of us in oral pathology have known about. Uh, I called it uh, chronic lingual papulosis. You have probably seen some people with tongues that look like they, instead of the normal papillae, they have tiny irritation fibromas. Each one is puffed up, and if you biopsy them, they're fibrous. Well, the acute counterpart of that is this. You get a tiny little pustule. Mostly it happens with cheese, hot cheese from pizza or French onion soup. I don't know if any of you have had it, but uh, you know exactly when it happens because you get this large single filiform papilla and it's exquisitely painful and uh, you go on the internet to find out what these things are and you will find that people call them liars bumps or liar lie bumps and supposedly uh, in folk culture if you tell a lie you get one of these as punishment and there are even some treatments that I have read on the internet uh, for these one is to take a uh, fingernail clipper and just cut it off. Uh, so it's kind of an inter interesting read if you want to look into those. But they produce a very exquisitely painful, kind of clear blister, sometimes a pustule. And that can look uh, like this as well. And every time you have an abscess tooth, you can get a blister, a vesicle looking thing at the end of the, the fistulous tract. And uh, these tonsil tags, I mentioned them yesterday because they're dark with the uh, Velscope and this autofluorescence material or these devices. And it is, in fact, um, pretty invisible most of the time. But if somebody has a need for lymphoid uh, activity, then they will puff up. And they're often very clear and they look like little blisters, but they're not. And uh, the other thing is there's one vascular tumor, the lymphangioma, that usually is a developmental thing, so you see it in kids and it just sort of grows with them as they grow. Every once in a while after trauma in an adult it will happen. But hemangiomas, the normal ves vessel tumor, stays fairly tightly together. But these vesicles, or these vessels, will travel, uh, we had a movie uh, about 20 years ago called Dune, and they had sandworms, and these are big, huge worms that would go under the sand, and the back would lift up, and all you would see would be the top of the back, and you would know a sandworm was there. That's the way lymphangiomas are. The vessel comes to the surface, and it looks like a little blister, and it goes down and comes to the surface, and it looks like another blister a few millimeters away. So these are the, the things that are pseudo-vesicles that at least you have to run them through your mind very briefly before you can start thinking of a viral disease. Herpes simplex, uh, a lot of the herpes viruses were just different diseases. 
Uh, but uh, about 15 years ago, the viral experts decided, well, these are really all cousins of the same thing. And that all happened because of the invention in the late 80s of um, a, a new diagnostic or, or research device called the PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Without that, we would know very little about viruses today. And we have different technologies. Some of them are even better now. And the PCR has changed. But um, I had an NIH grant to look at human papillomavirus, those, those two that are cancer-related, types 16 and 18. And the only reason I could even do that was because the PCR had just been made commercially available the year before. So that's how, this is all within the last two decades, really, that we've known about viruses. And it's been a phenomenal, almost astronomical leap in our understanding of these things. I'm kind of keeping things basic here because this is more clinical and I, I'm trying to be practical. But these are, these are the herpes viruses. We have eight of them. One of them was seen in AIDS, and that is the Kaposi sarcoma. One of them was, when I was young uh, in dental school, this was uh, uh, considered an almost unseen disease, cytomegalovirus. And today, uh, the majority of Americans have cytomegalovirus in their bodies. So it's something that we just have got, gotten used to or had to get used to. Epstein-Barr virus is a disease that is associated with uh, certain malignancies as well, the lymphomas in particular, um, whereas the, uh, the Kaposi sarcoma, of course, is related to vascular and fibroblastic malignancies. We have um, a little bit of a problem with Epstein-Barr because we are trying to figure out if this is a lymphoma of the throat and it really is the cause of almost all lymphomas in the throat, then if we find a lymphoma in the oral cavity, we should have the same thing. But we're not finding EBV very much in the oral cavity, lymphomas. This is, uh, however, something that you will find and you'll probably miss repeatedly in your practice because uh, the, our lifestyle is such that everybody's tired all the time. I'm, I'm sure you're all tired uh, and I'm, I know you wish you weren't here. But, um, nevertheless, uh, this is uh, hard to diagnose because the symptoms are, are part of everybody's lifestyle. But chronic fatigue syndrome, when it first got started uh, back in the early 80s, was called the yuppie disease. A yuppie in America was a young, upwardly mobile professional person working all the time. And they're the ones who got tired and they're the ones that got the Epstein-Barr uh, in their bodies. And very shortly it went from that to being called the Epstein-Barr viral disease, chronic Epstein-Barr disease. And that's, that was my diagnosis when I was diagnosed with that in the mid-1980s. Now, of course, we know that it's really an immune phenomenon and we don't know if the EBV produces it or is just a rider along with the other symptoms. But it's a pretty important family of, um, of um, diseases for dentistry. Not that you'll run into it every day, but when you do run into it, you have to know what to think. Uh, you have to know at least what a differential diagnosis is because uh, the whole purpose of making a differential diagnosis, these are clinical lists, remember, the whole purpose is so that, and you don't have to write it down, it can be in your head, but the whole purpose is to know which of these is the worst possibility. And then you have to act accordingly. If you have a, a potential malignancy as your worst possibility, then you have to refer that patient off to somebody who can evaluate that aspect. Uh, if there is nothing serious, if your choice is between a herpes simplex or hand, foot, and mouth disease, in two weeks they're all gonna be over anyway. So the most uh, you really have to do is warn them not to kiss any newborn babies because they might be giving it to an infant and stay away from kissing people with leukemia. That's about it. So um, the differential diagnosis is extremely important. I'm not really stressing differential here, but that's just part. You can't be a proper diagnostician unless you know how to make a differential diagnosis. And quite frankly, some, sometimes with a certain lesion, you cannot. You know what a geographic tongue looks like. There's nothing else that looks like a geographic tongue. So you can't put more than one thing on your list. So that, that does happen, that's fine. 
Well, uh, all of these herpes lesions have, well, not all of them, but at least the simplex and the zoster herpetic lesions have one easy way to at least classify them into this herpetic category. If you get a very fresh blister, which you never see because the patient sits at home and thinks that this will go away, so it's two or three days before they come to your office and want to know, want, want some help. So, but if you do happen to see a fresh blister, you can break that open and using a tongue blade, just scrape the blister, get some of the fluid from the blister. You can do it out on the skin as well. And of course you have to have a microscopic slide somewhere in your office. But if you have a few slides in your office, and most labs like mine are more than willing to send out a cytology kit with a couple of slides. And uh, we also have a little bottle of spray that will fix the cells so they don't rot and they, they stick to the glass very well. But if you don't have a kit made for this, all you need is a piece of glass. You can smear the cells onto that glass. Try not to press too hard because you don't want to crush the cells. And then let it dry. It's best if it dries quickly, so I usually put it on a part of my arm where there isn't much hair so I can get the, my body temperature to dry it off a bit. And once the cells are dry, then you can use hairspray, uh, just a high alcohol content, and that will stick the cells to the glass and it will also fix them so that they won't rot away. And uh, then I can stain that slide and give you a diagnosis. What makes this unique is this kind of a phenomenon. They're called syncytial cells. Herpes simplex and herpes zoster both have the ability to take an epithelial cell and have the, we're not totally sure whether the nuclei multiply within one cell. We think that a bunch of cells come together and their cell bodies become one cell body. And that's why the term syncytial, uh, that's where it comes from. But no matter how it's, it, it, it originates, this is what we see. There is no other smear that we will see where we will find a keratinocyte, an epithelial cell that has multiple nuclei. There are some cancer cells, of course, that will do that, but that's a whole different look. So there's never any confusion. And at least you will know that it's one of those two entities. Either it's shingles or it's some kind of a herpes simplex infection. And by the time you get the cytology biopsy or cytology report back, of course the patient's going to be all healed. So it almost is never done. But it is out there and available for you to do. These are all DNA viruses, and that's one reason why the nuclei seem to be uh, able to survive so well. These are viruses that get into our DNA. Uh, so they'll snip out a little piece and stick themselves into the DNA and they will take over the cell. Uh, herpes simplex is kind of an interesting phenomenon. When I was again young, I guess I was in my residency, a very popular treatment was actually scientifically sound. That virus has to take over the protein making mechanism of the cell in order to replicate itself and it has to do that at a fair, at just the right speed and it will fill the cell with hundreds of thousands of new viruses and then that cell will burst and spread to surrounding cells. That's how that virus works. What happens if you really heat up that tissue so that the cell is, is metabolizing too fast for the virus to be able to use the mechanism properly? We had that treatment and we used, uh, we didn't use toluidin blue, we talked about toluidin blue yesterday, but we used methylene blue, same kind of a dye, one of the dyes we would use for nuclei. And we would put it on a fever blister and then we had to have the patient stand as close as they possibly could to the heat of a desk light so that it was very warm and that blue color would absorb the, the heat, the light and the metabolism would speed up to the point where the virus could not do its thing. And you would stop the virus. It wouldn't spread from that point. It actually worked pretty well. Until somebody looked on the bottle again and said, wait a minute, uh, number one, it says this is a carcinogen. 
And number two, how do we know if we're keeping all those viruses in the cells that they will not go on to become cancer? At that time, we had a false impression from our research. A lot of the oral cancer, precancer information in the early years of my life, we just took information from the uterine cervix data. And in the cervix, back in those days in the 60s and 70s, herpes simplex was considered to be the cause of cervical cancer. And cervical cancer was one of the biggest killers in our country. Now, because of pap smears, it is much more under control. Well, as it turns out, that was wrong. If you have one sexually transmitted disease, you actually have three on average. Some people have many more. And if you have herpes simplex, chances are really good you will also have human papilloma virus. So we had for decades the idea that this one virus, herpes simplex, caused cancer, very important cancer, of epithelial cells. And it was all based on the fact that we did not have the technology to identify papillomaviruses. And then that, that device, the machine, the PCR that I told you about came along and blew all of our ideas away. And that's happened in several areas in my career uh, where we, we were sure that we knew the cause of a problem. And once we got new technology, we found out that we were totally wrong. Well, so, during that time, that's when we were treating herpes simplex with this dye. And the physicians got on board and they said, wait a minute, you can't do this because you're leaving those viruses there. And herpes simplex type two certainly, and probably type one is a cause of cancer of the epithelium. So we all stopped it within six months all across America that died, we quit doing it. Well, what would we do now? What would you do if you had a herpes simplex? If you know that the virus has to have just the right temperature to make itself, to replicate itself properly. We're doing just the opposite. The best treatment I know for a fever blister is ice. You wrap a piece of ice, an ice cube, and a, a, a towel is too thick. It has to be a t-shirt or something like that. And put it over that lesion as soon as you feel the tingling or see the redness and chances are very good that it will not be able to go beyond that stage. And ice is not a carcinogen. <laughs> and ice does not cause any kind of problem at all. Um, the problem is uh, convenience. If you're going to work, you can't be sitting there with ice uh, on your lip all the time. If you're working on a patient, you're not gonna sit there working away while you hold ice over your lip. So um, we have a very simple and actually scientifically sound treatment that's been popular at least in oral path and oral medicine for about a decade now. And I have no idea why we didn't think of doing that earlier. It just amazes me how uh, really truly stupid we have been. Um, one of the lectures that I'm preparing to uh, give in um, Washington State next year, I'm calling that uh, things we should have known. And it's all of these kinds of things that we really should have known better and we treated people improperly. I don't think we killed too many people. I don't think we killed any people. But we weren't doing, we weren't using our heads. So that kind of thing does certainly go on with these entities. All of these uh, human, or herpes viruses, HHVs, are only found in humans. There are similar things in animals, but they don't cross over, and our viruses won't grow in other animals. So it's a very unique thing, and that's why the word human is part of the name. And they're all spread by body flu bodily fluids, and now with forensic pathology on TV all the time, bodily fluids can mean most anything, and uh, they're usually pretty yucky things. But bodily fluid mostly means saliva uh, in this case, and the saliva is taking on a whole new uh, image with the uh, proteomics and identifying systemic disease through protein patterns in saliva. So I, I really think of saliva as the wonder liquid. It's, uh, it, it's got a bad name because if you don't like somebody, you spit at them. So that's, that uh, is sort of like the worst, dirtiest thing you could do to somebody. But saliva is really, uh, we would have so many more problems if there was not a decent saliva in our mouths. So, 
I've already talked about the syncytial. These are all characteristics of all of these. I've also uh, not quite mentioned, but it's pretty obvious. These are all latent drugs. They get in, not latent drugs, but late, latent viruses. They get into literally our genes and they do something for a few weeks that can be very uncomfortable, sometimes can kill us, and uh, then they go into a latent phase and our immune system keeps them in the herpes uh, simplex category, for example, and zoster the virus kind of stays within the nerves. Uh, we used to think the virus is pushed up into the Gasserian ganglion, those that affect our area. But in fact, we know from recent research that's not true. These viruses are constantly going up and down, up and down the nerves. And if you get out in the sun and get a little bit of sunburn on your upper lip, then there are viruses in those nerves just ready to jump out into the epithelium. They are viruses that love epithelium and they love nerves, both. And uh, we have, these are also viruses just like the papillomavirus I've already mentioned. They're unique in that they do in fact, uh, not control, but uh, are very strongly associated with at least a couple of, kind of kinds of cancers. Uh, lymphomas as well as epithelial malignancies. So it's a pretty unique group of, of um, entities. And if we look at herpes simplex, um, I mean, the word is simplex, right? But uh, herpes simplex is really, really a confusing process, a uh, disease process. We've got all of these different kinds. Uh, I didn't even know. I had already been an oral pathologist for several years, and I didn't know that you can get esophageal herpes uh, until I got it myself. That was my primary herpetic attack. And I can tell you it was so painful, I just wanted to die. I didn't care if I lived. We have some things that are skin rashes and in a certain setting, somebody with leukemia, somebody who's a newborn baby and going through uh, that, that transition from the mom's immune system to the baby's immune system. If they just happen to get it at that time, then they can die from loss of body fluid and infection from all these open wounds. And this is the big problem. I don't know again about Guatemala, I haven't asked, but in the United States, encephalitis, the number two cause of encephalitis is in fact herpes simplex. And that includes both type one and type two. It's not that the virus that we think, I mean, everybody gets fever blisters and we think, oh, ha ha, it's, I have to look ugly for a week or two. Uh, but there are a few people that have, for reasons that are unclear at the moment, uh, they have an inability to fight that off. And uh, so the herpes simplex lesions can, are among the very short list of entities that I call red flag diseases. They will tell you as the dentist that uh, there's something wrong with this patient's body, not, not the mouth, but the body, because they're not responding. If you have a fever blister and it's a month late later and they still have fever blisters, Either you've got the wrong diagnosis, like it could be that sun poisoning, or there's something wrong with the, the patient's immune system. And nowadays, uh, an immune workup is very, very sophisticated and unfortunately very expensive. So uh, what I do is I send them to a good um, infectious disease physician and let that person decide just how much of a workup they want to do, uh, or uh, not, not I, I said infectious disease, but that was premature. I meant uh, a hematologist, immunologist. We have a lot of other things that are recurrent, and that's because of this uh, latency. And you can, you notice that uh, encephalitis is part of the primary as well as the recurrent problem. Well, let's look at that first attack. The first attack is something that is horribly painful. I don't know how many of you have seen somebody in that stage, but uh, they're little kids, they, they don't understand what's going on, it's extremely painful, and they just want it to be over with. But that's a very small minority of the cases. And uh, most of the time, actually it's higher than this if you look at just mild cases, most of the time there is nothing. The parents don't even know about it. There's a little blister, maybe the gingiva becomes red, uh, and that's it. And they're a little uncomfortable for a couple of days, and then it starts to heal. 
So for most of us, we never do have anybody recognize that first attack of herpes simplex. It occurs uh, generally in, well, I didn't, we, we know that it occurs because uh, virtually all of us have antibodies. I'm sure that's true in Guatemala as well as uh, it is in the United States. And if we all have antibodies and we all were exposed to it, and we were exposed in such a way that our body had to respond. So uh, herpes simplex is important, uh, is an important entity, this primary attack, but it is really not so important to dentistry because these kids go to the pediatrician. Every once in a while, a pediatric dentist will run into one. But uh, if you look at surveys of the kinds of mouth diseases pediatricians see, uh, other than uh, gingivitis kinds of problems, uh, what they see mostly is the herpes attacks. Keep in mind, this is called herpetic gingivostomatitis. This is the disease that has gingivitis, routine gingivitis. The gingiva is red and puffy, and th that part of the diagnosis or that part of the disease has nothing to do with seeing little viral vesicles. That part of the disease is a gingivitis, an acute gingivitis. Why is that important? Well, nowadays, especially in more well-to-do families, you don't really have a lot of interaction with a bunch of kids and until you get to college. And so uh, I've been in universities most of my adult life as a teacher, and so that's been my typical primary herpes attack patient. It's a college kid who gets worn down studying, studying for exams, for example, and they come in with this, these vesicles all over their body, and they, not their body, but their mouth, and they come in with this red, puffy gingiva. If they don't have that red, puffy gingiva, then I have to worry about a venereal disease, sexually transmitted herpes type, type 2. That is really the difference. It's not the vesicles, it's not the location of the vesicles, it's whether you have red gums, or as my mother used to say, gums. If you have red gums, then you have um, the good kind of herpes simplex. If you don't, then you got another problem and the patient has to be sent off for an evaluation by um, usually a GYN or a urologist. So an important signal, not so much for the kids in the routine age, age um, category, but for adult onset primary herpes. Uh, oropharyngeal herpes is every bit as painful as the esophageal herpes. Uh, esophageal herpes can actually slough the entire esophagus, and these people are prone to scar formation, but in the mouth, that doesn't happen. We can have very, very severe uh, effects in the mouth and there's, at least that's something you can assure the parents about. You're not gonna get, you'll be okay. After a couple of weeks, you'll be back to normal. And uh, one of the things you also, uh, at least when I get a primary herpes, I just give a couple of simple things. I tell the parents, watch, watch your child if, if the, he or she is going to start acting groggy or hallucinating or there's any kind of change that you might think that's different, mental change, then you ought to get them to a pediatrician right away. And I tell them that that's because the virus could go to the brain and cause some swelling of the brain. And uh, the other thing is uh, try to not touch the eyes because uh, I'm looking right now, I just caught you looking, going over your eyes like this, we all do that. And if, especially if you have uh, these vesicles, you kind of drool at the corner of your mouth and you can give your eye a herpetic infection. And that could lead to scar formation. It's very painful also, but it could lead to scar formation which eventually would end with uh, blindness, usually partial blindness. So that's a bit of a problem. Um, we have some medications in our country, uh, we've, uh, the FDA has been forced, uh, they were reluctant to do this, but about four or five years ago, the public forced them to have all these drug companies with uh, nice adult trials, drug trials. They said, now you have to do them on children because they're being used in children. And you are even recommending that uh, informally to your physicians for, uh, for example, acyclovir. 
it is an antiviral, anti-herpes attack, or anti-herpes anti medication that works somewhat well for the GYN, the gynecological herpes, herpes type 2. There, are, there is some evidence that uh, the primary tax will also be helped by this, but because these are usually in kids, it's an obvious disease. Uh, acyclovir is not used much unless encephalitis is suspected or the eye problems are suspected. If it remains in the mouth, we don't really use acyclovir or any kind of antiviral. We just tell the patient, um, you know, or the, the parents, give your kid as much ice cream as they want or milkshakes and uh, we, we can give them some uh, painkillers, but it really doesn't help very much. So this is a, uh, an entity that we have some medications for, but they're not really used very often. And uh, because we, and we don't have any proof that this is not harmful to kids. That proof is being done right now. I, I, for uh, about eight years, I've, I've been on the uh, Institutional Review Board for the University of Texas. That's the body that has to look at everybody's, everybody's research. If they're using humans uh, and they're using more than three people, <laughs> then uh, they have to go through our committee and get our approval and we have to evaluate the quality of the research. Otherwise, uh, it's abusing subjects, abusing patients. And uh, only in the past five years, uh, we've gotten some that it's really, for us, it's a rubber stamp because the protocols are all the same. They've been done for adults. Now we're doing it for children. So what we have to do is send that off to a faculty member in pediatrics and have them give us an, a letter saying what the uh, harmful effects might be or suggested. And that's really, I think, what our opinion is in that setting doesn't make any difference because I IRBs are federally mandated in our country. We have to. We cannot do research at any institution without those. And the federal, federal, the federal government is also mandating that all of this research be redone on kids, the stuff that we had before. That's a little bit of an aside, but eventually, maybe another 5, 10, 15 years, and we'll have uh, proof of safety for acyclovir in kids. There's a little bit of it out there right now. The pain control, uh, I'm not going to get into much of this, but we do know that with viscous lidocaine, especially in the young kids, they, they have some of this in their throat. That's another thing parents worry about. Is this going to go down their throat? And primary herpes shouldn't do that. If it's going to be in the esophagus, it will start in the esophagus. If it's going to be in the oropharynx, it will start in the oropharynx. If it starts in the mouth, it remains in the mouth. But uh, if, in fact, we give them a viscous xylocaine, which an adult can handle very nicely, uh, kids have a problem with swallowing, and they might actually swallow a, a, glob, a globule of this stuff, and that can cause some problems. So we try to keep the painkillers down as much as possible, but we do. Uh, usually the non-aspirin type of, of anti-inflammatories uh, are given. These are all the types of primary attacks. Uh, acute herpetic gingival stomatitis is the primary thing. We've told you about that. We get the gingivitis. We get blisters. Here they happen to be on the gingiva, but they, don't, uh, they can be anywhere in the body, including the dorsum of the tongue, which is a pretty rare site for most uh, infection, infectious diseases. You can get uh, involvement of the vermilion border, just like a herpes labialis. It can go out a bit on the skin. But that's one thing you also probably should warn the parent about and one thing you look for. These vesicles can get out on the skin, but if you see anything beyond the nasolabial fold, if you get out here in the cheek, that shouldn't happen. Herpes simplex does not do that. The primary attack doesn't do that. The secondary attacks don't do that. That's a sign of some kind of immune surveillance problem. So it's fine to have, a, a, not fine for the patient, but fine for the diagnosis, to have vesicles out here. Um, it doesn't show up so much here, but it is not, if there's going to be oozing of the vermilion border, it gets dried out, unlike what we see in the mouth. And the vesicles in the mouth, when they break open, there's a little white, the, the surface becomes necrotic and white and it falls flat. And you can even scrape that off if you catch it in time. Out on the skin, it's different. Once that vesicle breaks, it's called a viral ooze. It becomes very thick and yellow in color. 
And so a yellow crusted lip is almost always a herpes lesion. If you get a hemorrhagic crust on the lip, then that is almost always an allergic reaction, maybe to the herpes, but uh, hemorrhagic crusts are usually erythema multiforme. So the color of the crust is kind of important, at least it, it's another little point that will help you make a proper diagnosis. And um, there's something that has happened. Uh, we, I grew up just sticking my hands in anybody's mouths. I didn't put on gloves. Uh, I've had psoriasis most of my life. And uh, washing my hands so much really brought that out. So I would have little cracks on my hands. And I would just stick them in people's mouths. And I've been wearing gloves for 20 years now. And just the thought of doing that is just uh, yuck, you know. I just, and so uh, I, I don't do it except for special friends nowadays. But since we started wearing gloves, if you look at a, a, an electron microscopic view of that latex in the glove, there are huge holes that you could fit 5,000 viruses through any one of those at one time. And yet, we've talked in oral path, we don't find these herpetic whitlows anymore. It used to be herpetic whitlows, the, the primary attack, and often the secondary attack, is on the finger. You can get a primary attack here, you have a little cut or something on your finger, you put your mouth and somebody, your, your finger into somebody's mouth and you get the virus in the cut. That's how it is initiated. And we used to have one or two dentists or dental hygienists or physicians or nurses every year come in with a herpetic whitlow. One of my patients had a herpetic whitlow. One of my students developed herpetic whitlow and she developed in her recurrence, it could be on the finger, but in her case, it was on the lip. And uh, she unfortunately had this erythema multiforme problem I mentioned. Herpes simplex attacks are the, one of the main triggers for a, an allergic react, reaction, erythema multiforme. And I've known her for 30 years now, and it still is happening. Every time she gets a fever blister, she knows she's gonna have these ugly red patches all over her face and her upper body. And so she has to shut down her practice for two weeks, three weeks, until she starts looking normal again. Every time she has a herpes attack. And her, her primary attack was on her finger, not on her lip. So you get some, at least I've had some interesting uh, um, phenomena associated with that. But in the oral path community, we've talked to each other. I haven't seen herpetic Whitlow myself in 15 years. And um, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the, the, the tension, the, the fluid tension, the, the surface tension that keeps viruses out. But we're, we're just not, these things are protecting us from uh, herpetic attacks. Keep in mind, somebody who's prone to herpes simplex, herpes labialis, the recurrent version, is going to have virus in their saliva before and after that, that attack. So you might be seeing them and probably will be seeing them frequently when they have the virus in their saliva, but they don't have any physical sign. So keep the gloves on. We have uh, her herpetic encephalitis and meningitis. I've already told you about. That is the, uh, the second most common cause of encephalitis, and it is the first cause of death from encephalitis in our, our country. And that's in kids doesn't happen very often in adults. This is kind of an interesting thing. Um, Kaposi's varicelliform eruption has a couple of uh, different uh, presentations. It could be somebody who's got eczema or some, some, some one of these chronic uh, damaged skin problems. And that kind of skin is prone to herpes spreading all over the body and recurring. And uh, I mentioned one way to die with that happening is loss of body fluid or just tons of infection from all these open wounds. Well, that's just a pretty serious thing, but we have a more mild attack in our wrestlers because it only came out when we started using rubber mats for wrestlers back uh, about 30 years ago. And the rubber surface causes small little abrasions of the skin. And these guys are sweating and probably some saliva is getting out on the mat when they're wrestling 
and then they're thrown down on the mat and uh, the saliva or the sweat, we don't know for sure, but this, and we'll say saliva, touches their abrasion on their back. And uh, it's called uh, herpetes gladiatorium, or gladiatorum. We just call it uh, wrestler's herpes. It's kind of a unique form of herpes simplex. This is uh, one that can happen with uh, herpes type 1 or 2. Probably the classic scenario is somebody's mom has uh, type 2 herpes at the time of birth. And uh, going through the birth canal, the baby is abraded a little bit. Um, and the, some of the herpes gets in the skin. The other scenario I mentioned is if they have eczema or some other dermatitis. And this is the kind of thing I mentioned, if you get the herpes vesicles outside this nasal labial fold, then you should assume the patient's got a problem with an underlying immune system. And we don't know exactly why these kids, they don't, there hasn't been an identified immune incompetence in them, but it is maybe because they're so young and they're, the immune system that they have is their, their mother's immune system. It seems to be something that just spreads like wildfire and it frequently starts in the facial area. It spreads, can go up covering the head, wipe out any hair that the kid might have, and then uh, start working around the rest of the body. And it's uh, not a very, very uh, good disease at all. And I've mentioned that, uh, that when we have type 2 herpes, it looks very much like a primary type 1 herpes. Here is a woman who came in, a young lady, and she had these vesicles about once every month, sort of coincided with a certain time in her period, her menstrual cycle. And uh, I looked at this, and it's a pretty obvious viral thing, especially with that history. This, this is another patient, similar. And if you look, you don't see any pink here, you don't see any gingivitis, and I really had no option then but to test for type 2 herpes. And I only did that because now we're in a, a politically and socially sensitive problem because I have to have that conversation about uh, sexually transmitted diseases. And I've had two patients in my lifetime who used my herpes type 2 culture diagnosis to uh, prove uh, that their husbands were cheating on them and it led to divorces. So um, you don't run into those kinds of things mostly in dentistry. But in oral pathology and in oral medicine, uh, we get some fairly unique situations. So that's extremely important. We also uh, keep in mind that um, sexually transmitted herpes uh, does occur, and there's child abuse, sexual abuse goes going on, so you can't really avoid uh, thinking about it at least, and uh, at least having the thought pass through your mind that Maybe this is an abusive situation. There's one problem that uh, we don't really know what, I don't know what to do with, canker sores. Uh, your patients think they're all viruses, their physicians give acyclovir or some kind of antiviral, and it's totally useless. They're, they're not viral diseases. Uh, the canker sores, aphthous stomatitis, is a cluster of different diseases that have, happen to have the same presentation, about a dozen different diseases. And one of those diseases is just pure recurrent aphthous stomatitis. But we've cultured and cultured and cultured, and we cannot find herpes as a cause of this. Sometimes it's an immune attack, autoimmune attack. Sometimes it is trauma-related, sometimes it is vascular problems, a vasculitis. So um, we don't know what causes that, but there is this small group of people that have canker sores that are very tiny. They look like vesicles that are broken open. And as long as I've been in oral path, we've called that herpetiform aphthystomatitis. And there are studies that have shown that 20 to 30, 35% of these lesions actually will have herpes in them. And I, I don't know what to do with that. Uh, I mean, it's kind of silly if, if something has herpes in it and it looks like herpes, why do they call it herpetiform after stomatitis? So I think there, there is in that particular category a lot of misdiagnoses. But still, two-thirds of them, 80% of them do not have any kind of a, a viral 
problem. So there must be a real herpetiform form of canker sores. And hand, foot, and mouth is a disease that also is uh, something you have to think about. One of the kind of a loose rule of thumb is that uh, the vesicles in that are small in numbers. If you get eight or 10, that's actually quite a bit. And they remain in front of the first molars. So there's an anatomic location that helps, and there is a number that helps. On the other hand, herpes attacks in the mouth can occur with small numbers of vesicles, and usually they remain in the anterior, anterior of the molars. So it doesn't help from herpes simplex separating it, but it will help separate this lesion from another viral attack, and that we'll get to later, and that is herpangina. You should know that hand, foot, and mouth and herpangina were both viruses that came out of the same grade school in a little town called Coxsackie, New York. So the virus is called Coxsackie. In the mid-1950s, it happened one year apart. And that was just in the 1950s. And now all across America, if you test people for antibodies against those Coxsackie viruses, almost all of us have those antibodies. Uh, it is kind of scary when you think about things like um, um, uh, biological warfare, how fast things can spread, uh, especially nowadays. Um, and one of the things that hand, foot, and mouth does, that herpes does, and no other virus does that we deal with in dentistry is make these little vesicles and blisters in the, on the hands and feet. They're usually on the palms or the soles, but if you at least take a quick look at the hands and ask about tenderness of the feet, um, in my business, it's not so unusual for me to ask the patient to take off his or her shoes and look at feet. But um, I think that's perfectly legit if you're trying to make a diagnosis. And I told you also about these look-alike lesions. I'm just kind of briefly going through these look-alikes right now. Th these are these very clear vesicles. Here's some poor person who has probably uh, half a dozen of them, and this patient has dozens. All of the filiform, or fun, yeah, filiform papillae are puffed up, and they're so edematous that they look clear like blisters. But these hurt, and they don't break open. A herpetic lesion can hurt a lot, but it should break open within a matter of five or six hours, usually a matter of minutes. So a lesion of the dorsum of the tongue, especially the anterior part, is a different ballgame. And these things remain in place for sometimes weeks. And if you, this is the one where people would recommend uh, taking a, a little nail clipper to, to um, remove them. This is a very unique uh, patient. I didn't really know that this happened when this patient saw me. But, excuse me, we all know about strep throat. It's an extremely painful lesion of the uh, throat, the pharynx. Uh, it produces redness. It's one of the things that red color is one of those things that physicians use to decide whether it's a strep throat or a virus sore throat, viral sore throat, upper respiratory infection. And if it's red, then they will give antibiotics. They may even culture to try to find the strep. Well, there is, in fact, an oral version of strep throat that is extremely painful, and the pain is on the tongue. And uh, you know that strep is also the cause of scarlet fever. And in scarlet fever, we have always had this coated tongue. First, we have a raspberry tongue. Um, I guess you have raspberries here? <laughs> okay. So raspberry tongue, where all the filiform puff up just like this, but they're kind of red. And then uh, as time, well, I'm, I'm sorry. Initially, we get a strawberry tongue, where we get those puffed up papillae, but there's whiteness between them. And some of the papillae themselves are white. And then as time goes on over a matter of a few days, the white disappears from the front to the back and you end up with just these bumps, the white, and they're all red. So that's when we go from a strawberry tongue to a raspberry tongue. And I have no idea why we, we label them food, uh, but that's what we do. And there are people who don't have scarlet fever. They don't have any kind of fever at all. They don't have strep throat. They just have this mouth problem, this tongue problem that's exquisitely painful. It lasts for about a week. 
and then it's over and the tongue can go through the same changes as a scarlet fever tongue. That being the case, it's essentially scarlet fever without the scarlet or the fever. Uh, so strep mouth is a, sort of a, not the best word, but it's a word we use. You know that strep normally is in our mouths, but in this case it's the L form, the painful, the pain producing form of the strep that is found in uh, culture. So it's a very uh, unusual event, but it does occur, and it is one of the things that is producing a, a viral look-alike. And uh, just another view of a look-alike lesion. I told you about these little tonsil tags is probably as good a name as any. This is the oral floor, and you can see there, this is, these are all visible now. There's a little one here. They're all visible because this is a patient who's got a sore throat and, and everything is puffed up, all the lymphoid tissue. But uh, a few weeks later, I didn't see this patient a few weeks later, but I'm sure it, you, would not have even, you wouldn't have noticed these in a routine oral exam. Unless you were looking for them, you wouldn't notice them. But they, excuse me, they do have kind of a semi-translucent look to them. White blood cells do look like that when they're not stained. Uh, they can look semi, it, if somebody has leukemic gingivitis, for example, and they have a bunch of malignant leukocytes in their gingival tissues, I've had maybe a half a dozen patients where it looks like I can look all the way down to the bone. It's an illusion, but that's what it looks like. And this tissue has the same appearance. But of course, this is going to last forever. And uh, so that will help you distinguish it very quickly from a viral attack. So those are the lookalike lesions. And uh, the virus, as I mentioned, goes up into the Gasserian ganglion, but we, ganglion, but we know now that, in fact, uh, it is constantly traveling. I don't know if you remember this from uh, your neuroanatomy, but uh, there, there is no lymphatic system as such in a nerve, and uh, there is no downstream. If you put something as big as a candida which is big enough to see with uh, a low power view on my microscope. If you put something that big into a peripheral nerve at the end, it will find its way into the Gasserian ganglion. So downstream is actually upstream. Things that uh, are put in the tips of the nerves end up in the ganglion. Well, if in fact you have infection in the ganglion, that will also, using the same vessels, travel out. And you will have disease attacks uh, occurring on the end. You'll even get an inflammatory response that was started in the Gasserian ganglion. So it's, it's like a sewage system that goes in two directions at the same time. Uh, it's very unique. At any rate, we've got um, fever blisters, cold sores. Those are the terms we use in our country. And quite frankly, there are a lot of dentists who get the, the words canker sore and fever blister mixed up. But fever blister, the name comes from the fact that you have a, you're, you're ill. You've got an infection, it gives you a fever. Your immune system is being used to fight that attack or attack that particular problem. And the surveillance against these viruses in your nerves isn't quite as good as it normally is. And so the virus jumps out of the nerves and into the, uh, the epithelium. It can produce this yellow crusting. This is just broken open. That yellow viral ooze, a pustule, is a vesicle that's full of pus, and that usually has a whitish color. You can get a puffy lip associated with it. You can get red background. It's almost always associated with it. There is no, a lot of people are given antibacterials for these these um, entities by their physicians, not so much by dentists. And there's no logical reason for that, but it's that confusion between cold sore and fever blister. Um, I mean, uh, canker sore and fever blister. There, there just is almost no distinction in people's minds between those, but they're very different diseases. So uh, what ha you have to look for, there is a legitimate reason to give antibiotics to somebody with a herpes labialis. There are two reasons. One is the lip really puffs up. The virus doesn't do that. That has to be a secondary bacterial 
response. And so you, you get an angioedema or just a, an edema, puffiness of the lip. The other thing is if you have some enlarged tender lymph nodes, uh, recurrent herpes shouldn't be doing that either. And so on the assumption that those are secondary bacterial problems, you can legitimately give an antibiotic. In our country, we have almost a scandal going on because of all the antibiotics given out for everything, uh, mostly by physicians. But in our country, 80% uh, of all antibiotics are given to uh, cows, chickens, and pigs. And we're getting that into our bodies through our food source. So uh, we're, we're developing a population with a whole bunch of resistant bugs. And that's going to be causing, it does cause some real problems for us already. Uh, by the way, I want to mention, we're dealing with the, the trigeminal nerve. I don't know if you appreciate this. Those of you who haven't started clinical work yet um, probably don't appreciate it. Those of you who have, I'm sure don't appreciate it. But this is really a phenomenal nerve. 40% of all the sensory input, the sensory interpretation done by your brain is done to interpret the trigeminal nerve signals, 40%. And you're dealing with that all the time. You pull a tooth, you rip it, <laughs> you get a dental infection around it, and we don't seem to have to worry about it. Uh, it's a pretty phenomenal thing, but it is a scary nerve. And if you look at trigeminal pain, trigeminal neuralgia, for example, um, I did this a long time ago. I made a little uh, list of the Actually, I got it from a dictionary, Dorland's Dictionary. I made a list of the neuralgias in the human body. And 85, no, there were about 15 of them that are in the head and neck area, and only three of them elsewhere in the body. And the head and neck lesions are almost all trigeminal areas, some facial. So think about that. You're working every single day around that kind of a nerve that can produce so much pain that it can produce a disease called trigeminal neuralgia that's associated with the highest level of suicide, higher than cancer patients. And we get away with it. We don't even think about it most of the time. So uh, we have uh, an intraoral herpes as well. When I was a resident or a dental student, if we saw what looked like herpes simplex in the mouth, we were told that doesn't exist. It cannot happen. So you must think of something else. And we would always scratch our head and say, well, what else is there? And they would say, think of something else. These are our teachers. <laughs> um, so the students were making up names. But of course, as time went on, enough cases developed. Um, and these patients went to the right people who were writing some papers. And now we very well accept that there is an intraoral recurrent herpes, not a herpes labialis. You might call it recurrent herpes gingivalis, I guess, because uh, it's usually in the gingival tissues. By definition, it has to be bone bound. So you have to have bone under the vesicles. If, and that is still a pretty firm, well, that is a very firm rule. If you see vesicles in an adult inside the mouth and it's not over an area with bone beneath, then you have to think of another diagnosis. So that's still a rule. but. Also, it is something that um, I call it a coin lesion. You can take a quarter and cover up virtually all of the vesicles. Why is that important? Because the other lesion that will do this is shingles, herpes zoster. And that, by routine presentation, spreads out over a large area. So that will help you. The cluster effect will help you to try to distinguish between the two. Is that important? They're, they're both going to be over and done with soon. Well, there are two reasons uh, to know the difference. One is herpes zoster, all the, all the zoster infections, the, they have a different viral attack pattern. Herpes simplex, all the viruses is there. You got everything within, unless they have an immune problem, all of your vesicles are there within 24, maybe 36 hours. With chicken pox and shingles, you're getting new vesicles two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight days after the first ones occur. So by following a pattern, you can even make a distinction between those two. But the biggest reason for making that distinction is that herpes simplex 
goes on to leave you alone. Uh, as long as you have a decent immune system, it will stay in your, your, um, your nerves and you won't have a problem except maybe your herpes labialis. But shingles produces this thing called post-herpetic pain. And that is as, as painful as trigeminal neuralgia. And the vesicles are not present. That could happen six months or a year after the vesicles are all healed. So at least being aware of that, you'll have a diagnosis and then they won't be looking for brain tumors and things like that in your patients. And you'll have an explanation for this pain in your patient. And you'll also be able to say, well, this might last a year or two or three, but almost always it does go away. The pain does go away. The herpes attacks uh, are triggered by trauma. They're, attacked, uh, they're triggered by sunlight in particular. They're triggered by a wide variety of different things, including food. Tomatoes, peanuts, those kinds of things will trigger herpes attacks. And anybody who has enough recurrent herpes knows exactly what foods to avoid. So you can prevent your own attack. And uh, what I do, uh, it's not very sophisticated. Well, it is sophisticated, but normally I recommend people just try ice because by the time they get to me, they've already had a herpes recurrent, herpes type one attack uh, for enough time. So the antivirals are not going to be working. They're only going to work if you can catch that in the prodromal stage, that little tingling the day before or the redness that might be present, then an antiviral might work. But uh, at least in my experience, say, they haven't worked nearly as well as just using ice. As far as treatment, we don't really have um, a good treatment for this. Uh, GYN uh, herpes, herpes type 2, is a very serious problem. Remember, there was a time when it was thought excuse me, to be related to one of the worst cancers around. And so there was a lot of research put into it. Right now, the research is still uh, being done for new generations of antivirals, but it's not for oral stuff. It's for the type 2 herpes. And what we do in dentistry is we just sort of beg and borrow from the research done by the GYN community and then try it on some uh, recurrent herpes simplex. I don't know why uh, canker sores and herpes labialis are very common diseases. You would think it would be financially profitable for a drug company to come up with a solution. But so far, we got nothing, really. I mean, we've got ice for the lip, and we, got, we haven't got anything uh, other than steroid injections for canker sores. Um, and I've been waiting literally 40 years for somebody to come up with a good treatment for either one of those entities. I don't think, even though we've got drugs, I don't think we're any further along than, um, than uh, we were when I was in dental school. So should you try acyclovir or uh, vancyclovir, any of the newer generations of antivirals? I think it's always worth a try. I give my patients a prescription. Usually it's uh, the valcyclovir that I use. And I tell them at least get it filled and when you feel that prodromal sensation, start it. Because some people, that does work very dramatically, but it's a very small number, in my opinion. I knew back when uh, I was a resident that we didn't have a treatment for this because the American Dental Association had a weekly newsletter. They still have it. It's called a different name. It was ADA News. And uh, they had a l opinion page, letter to the editor. And somebody said, hey, I've got a perfect treatment for herpes labialis. I, gave, I give this to all my patients. And then uh, somebody else the next week said, no, this is a perfect treatment. And somebody else the third week, we had a couple of letters saying, no, I, I've got this. This works really well. And by the end of that little conversation, it took about a year, there were over 30 different surefire treatments for herpes labialis. And you know if that is out there, that there is no treatment for herpes labialis. But it's worth trying because a few people do respond uh, to, um, to that sort of thing. I want to remake that point because it's really important. Herpes simplex is maybe the best, because it's so common, it's maybe the best of all these red, red flag diseases. If it doesn't have the usual biological behavior of a herpes labialis, then think about the patient's immune system. And part of that is duration. 
if it lasts longer than eight, nine, ten days, certainly if it's more than two weeks, there's something wrong. Either you have a bad diagnosis or you have an immune problem. You can have a very serious herpetic problem inside the nasolabial fold, even extending into the nostrils, and that's okay. That's part of the herpes simplex experience. But if it gets beyond that nasolabial fold, then maybe you don't have to tell the patient that right away, but uh, at least watch it, have the patient back more frequently or more extensively. I won't uh, get into all of the treatments for this, but uh, I think probably famcyclovir is, has been tried by some of my colleagues. Uh, valacyclovir is probably the one that most of us use. Uh, this is still more of a GYN problem, but they all seem to have a similar effectiveness, and we're talking about systemic medication now. Acyclovir is available as a topical as well. And it's, I think it's fine to give topical and uh, systemic acyclovir. Well, we'll before the break, we'll close up with uh, some of these additional look-alike lesions. This is uh, one of those uh, foolers. I, I was called to the ortho clinic, and uh, they wanted me to see this young person who had this problem um, the day after an ortho appointment that was a rather extensive appointment time-wise. And the patient came in with these yellowish oozing vesicles. They were still kind of close to the nasolabial fold, but uh, I, I said, okay, it's a herpes problem, but that's because it's getting a little bit too far into the face, the skin of the face, I'd like to see the patient again. And of course, I knew my diagnosis was wrong because this lasted, I think, six weeks. Uh, the, the problem also was a follow-up. The patient didn't come back in a proper time, but it's such an easy treatment. You can have the patient go to a drugstore and get a tube of antibacterial medication and put it on, and this stuff will be gone in a day. Uh, it also, uh, Impetigo has a bad reputation as being something only seen in dirty little kids uh, who are packed together in communities, and it's really not the case. Any little kid can get Impetigo. Uh, it is a, usually a staph, or it can be a strep um, bacteria. Staph will pr produce little oozing pustules, and when a strep is involved, you can actually get some very large blisters involved with that. And impetigo can go all over the face, and it really doesn't reflect the immune response in that patient. So keep that in mind. This is something you have to think about before you can diagnose a herpes labialis. And also that acute sun poisoning, this was actually my lab tech. So I had daily contact with her, and she was one of these young ladies who had not gone out in the sun at all during the winter, went to the beach in Florida, and uh, after the first day she had these pustules, very, very painful, all over her lower lip, a little bit on the upper lip, and the lower lip was also puffy. And of course, uh, me being uh, the great guru of diagnosis, I uh, diagnosed the wrong thing. And I, I said it's a herpes thing, so just try to keep it dry. This was before we were using ice. And I gave her, I think, uh, some codeine, some kind of a pain pill to get her through. But it lasted, I think it would have lasted probably months and months. But eventually we ended up using topical corticosteroid because this is kind of an allergic, re it's a hypersensitivity response to ultraviolet light, essentially. It is uh, especially serious on the skin in women who have jewelry that has a high nickel content. And so you'll see the outline of the, uh, the uh, jewelry, the necklace, for example, will all become red and uh, pustular. The, uh, this is uh, something that can attack uh, the whole face. The lower body doesn't seem to be very often affected, but you can get acute sun poisoning from that as well. And then there's certain medicines, we, we, and, and not only medicines, but uh, products that we use on a daily basis Tetracycline is probably uh, one of the worst uh, for bringing on these kinds of attacks, uh, like allergic reactions. We're going through a problem right now with antibacterial soaps because we were told this is God's gift to mankind, and now we're being told a whole bunch of people are getting allergic responses to this, 
and we really shouldn't be recommending antibacterial soaps, the liquid forms, as much as we are. There are people who respond to uh, birth control pills, uh, usually that's with the menstrual cycle. Tranquilizers have produced uh, the, a, a type of allergic reaction of the lips that looks similar to this, and some, some of the, especially ACE inhibitors, are especially well known for producing these big puffy lips. Uh, I don't think there's a physician in the world, at least in our country, that doesn't know that if you come in with a puffy lip and you're on an ACE inhibitor to lower your blood pressure, the reason for the puffy lip is the ACE inhibitor. So there are a few other reasons for a puffy lip and little vesicles. And also, if you are a person who is given chronic corticosteroids, Maybe you have acne, maybe you have a lung fibrosis problem, maybe you have lupus, but you're put on corticosteroids over months and months. And in some individuals, the acne around the face, the sweat glands around the face, become secondarily infected because of the steroid. The mechanism is unclear to me anyway. I don't think anybody knows. But you'll get an acne type of thing, some with pustules, that will occur only around the mouth. And this is not a name that was given to this disease by dentists. This is what the dermatologists have. Perioral dermatitis is a sort of an acne or, or sweat gland, s small, low-level infection produced by long-term corticosteroid use. Somebody asked me about using lysine, uh, an essential amino acid for uh, herpes labialis. That was a treatment that was proposed uh, very enthusiastically back in the 19, late 70s or early 80s. And I recommended that. It's not really prescribed. It's something you buy over the counter in uh, vitamin stores. And uh, there were some people who responded very dramatically. I think, uh, I don't know for sure, but I assume these are people with uh, lysine deficiencies maybe or some problem with met metabolizing lysine and maybe their herpes simplex was a um, response to that particular problem and the lysine helped. I don't think it hurts at all to recommend that to your patients. Uh, let them, they would have to try it for about six or seven months to make sure that uh, it is effective, and if it doesn't do anything after that, then, then they go off of it. But I do have one patient in particular who, whom I have followed for over 30 years, and he was getting herpes labialis uh, vesicles maybe once every six, seven weeks for years and years before I met him, and that happened to be the time when Lysine was being touted as the cure for herpes labialis, and um, he tried it, and he's still using it, and he's never had an attack since then. Uh, that's not scientific proof, but it's a pretty interesting observation. So uh, this is the bad herpes. Uh, I've kind of alluded to the whole thing. Uh, there are certain things that are very serious. Uh, some are serious enough to be fatal that can happen, and... I've also mentioned the fact that this is a red flag disease. I didn't mention other red flag diseases, but probably other than the herpetic lesions, the uh, candida is, is probably the best other red flag disease. And the final one is one you deal with every single day of your lives, and that is gingivitis. Uh, there are people who have immune deficiencies, diabetes, et cetera, that will have a fairly atypical type of gingivitis, more rapid destruction, more puffiness than you would expect. Maybe that's see-through gingival tissue of leukemic gingivitis, for example. So uh, those are all red flag diseases, and it's your responsibility to make sure that you understand the routine biological behavior for all of these so that you know what is abnormal and you can refer the patient on. Uh, you're not expected as a dentist to make those systemic diagnoses, but you certainly should make a working diagnosis or a, a clinical suspicion of those. Well, probably as much as any other disease or problem, a herpes simplex attacks, recurrent herpes simplex, leads to erythema multiforme. Uh, this could be the routine erythema multiforme. The name, uh, for those of you who haven't run into it yet, you get red patches, blotches all over your skin and they seem to predominate above the waist. So uh, it's a, you look very 
unusual. It isn't uh, that these, these red patches break down uh, and cause massive ulceration, but some of them, in fact, do have fairly large blistering associated with them, and there can be secondary infection from that. Erythema multiforme can be recurrent. Most of the time, it's a one, one attack. And in my career, I've had, I worked, I think I told you yesterday, I worked very closely with the um, otolaryngology docs in, in our medical school, in our hospital. And uh, they would, they felt very comfortable asking me to come over and see patients of theirs in the hospital. And over a 30 year period, every time I went to the hospital and they had a diagnosis of adult onset primary herpes simplex, every single time, it was erythema multiforme. Even though I constantly pounded into their heads that you cannot, I mean, if you have a primary adult onset herpes, you have to have at least that gingivitis. They never looked for that. Uh, so I guess that proves that I'm not a very good teacher, but that, that is an interesting phenomenon that uh, they think uh, that an intraoral blisters and erythema of uh, erythema multiforme is just like a primary herpes attack. And in their training, I guess that's what they believe. Well, I don't want to harp on this anymore because I've already done it, but here's a lesion right on the nasal labial fold. I would be a little suspicious. The dentist sent this young lady to me because of bilateral involvement, and she had had herpes simplex attacks maybe two or three times a year for quite a few years at this point. I think she was 19. And uh, this, and then by the time she got to me, she had a vesicle up here, and it was creeping up above the nasal labial fold in this patient as well, although remember I said it can be in the nostril. There are, our ENT colleagues actually see frequently herpes, recurrence her, herpes in the nostril. It doesn't affect the lower part of the lip. We see the lip lesions, they see the nose ones. But uh, because of this lesion, I sent her to a um, hematology friend of mine, and this was the very first sign that she had leukemia. I had uh, an uncle who used to smoke a pipe, and I went to visit him once. He was about 60, and he asked me as I was leaving, I said, he said, can you look at this uh, where I hold my pipe? And it was an ulcer that hadn't been healing for three months, he said. No redness around it, which is another very abnormal thing uh, for an ulcer that's constantly being traumatized. And I just jokingly said, well, you've either got diabetes or leukemia. And that was the very first sign that he had leukemia. He was dead within two weeks. But our, our role in dentistry is to try to find these potential problems and get them to a physician because, you know, leukemia is a disease that if it can be diagnosed, and now with treatments, uh, there are some very effective therapies that uh, are more effective the earlier the diagnosis. And just, just as with the precancers and oral cancers, our role isn't so much to treat these systemic problems as to be physicians of the mouth and, and realize that this is a problem that is associated with something uh, elsewhere in the body. Uh, so I mentioned all of this. Uh, also, biological behavior. Normally, a herpetic uh, lesion of the lip is gone within seven days. The pain is gone within about five, six days. So, but if you give it two weeks, anything after two weeks, you really, if you're a general dentist, that you should at least send it off to a dermatologist or an oral pathologist, if you have one handy, there aren't too many of us around, um, for a second opinion. But um, and certainly by two and a half weeks, uh, somebody should be looking, doing a simple blood study to make sure there's no leukemia going on. These can all be confused with diseases that I've already mentioned, uh, perioral dermatitis, and uh, that's also a form of candidiasis. A lot of candida gets involved in that because of the steroid therapy. And uh, all of the same things that we've talked about uh, for uh, type 1 are also true here as lookalike lesions. There was a, a name, uh, this is an old German name, the Pospischiel Ferter disease, or sometimes it's called a syndrome. And uh, it is very dramatic. This is probably the classic red flag problem. Uh, and so it's worth illustrating. And I can probably illustrate it best by giving you my experience. Uh, when I was a resident, one of my good friends was an endo resident. And he came to me on Monday and said, you know, my fever blister is getting a little out of hand. And I said, well, let's wait a day or two. 
and by Tuesday it was covering half of his face. By Wednesday his whole head was covered. He looked very much like this and he was hospitalized. And by Friday he was dead. And that was the first sign that he had leukemia. I don't mean to imply that everybody dies right away just because you made that diagnosis. But uh, because there are many other patients I've had where I picked up an early sign and uh, the patient survived because of that early t treatment. But this, this does show how dramatic this kind of a disease can be if you don't have a good immune system. And uh, this is not so uh, unusual in terminal states. That's what's going on with this patient. She has, uh, they put some, the blackness, by the way, is a uh, medication that they put on top of all the, bl the blisters. But um, I have had now in my career two people in the terminal stage, stage of cancer. Neither one of them had a bone marrow transplant. They were, one was a breast cancer patient and one was a prostate cancer patient. But they're now in their last several weeks of life, and they know it, and their docs know it, and they've been through lots of chemotherapy that affected their immune system. And these were both people who in their earlier lives had repeat bouts of herpes labialis, and uh, they had a full-blown primary herpes attack. It shows what can happen when your immune system doesn't control. You can have essentially a virgin body relative to viruses that are, have been in your body for decades and it attacks, that virus attacks you as if you have never had contact with it. Well, herpes zoster is a, uh, a bug that has, uh, it used to be a problem of childhood uh, because of the chicken pox, but at least in our country, we've, we've been vaccinating against it for about 12 or 15 years, I think. And um, we're, we should be reaching a point where another 15, 20 years, those people will reach an age where they should be getting their shingles attack and they won't get their shingles attack because they've had the vaccination. So that herpetic, post-herpetic neuralgia, that pain that uh, the virus induces in some people should be a thing of the past as long as we keep our vaccinations um, um, under control or, or popular, I guess is the way to say it. But this is a disease, the VZ virus will produce Two, just like the herpes simplex, it produces two infections, as you know. The first one, varicella is the name of the disease, or chicken pox is pretty much what everybody says in our country. And shingles is also the name of the, the clinical name, but very often in seminars, professional lectures, it's called herpes zoster. So even though it's a varicella zoster virus, the zoster is the adult onset type of uh, lesion. And chickenpox, uh, you probably have picked up on the fact that uh, this is different from herpes simplex in a couple of major reasons, or a couple major ways, and that would be the intraoral versions. Uh, you're getting, regardless of whether it's primary or a secondary attack, you can get viruses as much as two weeks, new vesicles forming from the virus uh, after the first ones are arriving. So you can, you can have a healing vesicle or even a healed vesicle right next to a new one. And only the varicella zoster viruses will do that. Uh, if it's not a viral infection and you're getting that kind of a blister history, then maybe you ought to think about an autoimmune disease, and that, again, would be a dermatologist um, or family physician workup. Usually, uh, the, the varicella normally attacks a little older age group than the simplex, the chickenpox virus. Uh, it was, until the vaccine came out, really common, actually standard practice in the United States. If, if a family in a neighborhood got chickenpox and all the other mothers would bring their kids over to get their chickenpox, I mean, they would try to infect their kids. That's the only disease I know of where parents have done that. <laughs> And um, why would they do that? Well, because there is, it's not really a myth, it does happen, but you can become sterile. Uh, your eggs and your testicles can get infected and damaged to the point where you won't have the ability to have children if you have late onset chicken pox. And there is some of that that happens. It's not nearly as common as people suspect, but it does happen and so, Plus, the adult onset, the older age onset attacks are much more severe. 
uh, people feel more sick. And those are the reasons that the mothers actually make sense. Uh, Johnny's, uh, Johnny next door has chicken pox, so Charlie, my son, why don't you go and play with Johnny for a while? And so the whole neighborhood would get chicken pox all about the same time. That was essentially our way of vaccinating <laughs> our kids. Uh, now we stick a needle in the arm, and it seems to work pretty well. Almost all of us have been infected. Uh, if you look at our antibodies, we've all had contact, regardless of whether we came from a lower or higher socioeconomic uh, environment. And there is a short incubation period, but really uh, not significant enough. But the mothers, at least in America, know that uh, in two weeks, my son should have his chicken pox from playing with Johnny. And uh, that, that's information that is valuable in raising kids, so the moms know it. I don't think the dads know it nearly as well. Uh, it is true that uh, you can have the vesicles in the mouth as a very first sign, just like uh, herpes labialis might be a sign of uh, some systemic problem. This is a systemic disease, although it affects the skin primarily, but the mouth can be involved, just as you can have a genital uh, blister as well as the first sign. Usually on the skin, it uh, generally is going to cluster around the mid portion of the body and spread upwards more so than spread down, but you get a lot of these vesicles and you get new ones cropping up as the old ones heal, as I've already mentioned. In the mouth, it's pretty unusual for us or for the kids to have more than one, two, three, maybe four at the most ulcers. Uh, and they're ulcers. They break so fast that uh, I don't know if any of my colleagues have seen one of these in real life as a blister. And I know that I would know about that because if anybody had it, they would be giving us all the pictures uh, to use. This is the closest one I found, and that's already broken open. There was a time when every oropathologist, when their family was this age and getting it, they would bring them in when they're sick to the dental school and take pictures. So we all have plenty of pictures of chicken pox. And um, I suppose the, parent, the uh, other spouse didn't appreciate it, and the kids certainly didn't appreciate it. But that's part of the social history of this disease. As far as I know, there's no increase... Um, Severity, depending on how many vesicles you have, you, you are not, not increased severity, there's no increase in your immune response. You don't have a better immune response, you don't have more antibodies, more effective antibodies, just because you had a whole bunch of vesicles when you had. You have the same immune immunity from it, whether you had one vesicle or 500 vesicles. There is a certain amount of... Um, blister formation on the skin that remains blistering because the skin is a little tougher than the mucous membrane. So the dermatologists have lots of pictures with uh, blister formation. Most of the time they just break open uh, as a vesicle, but sometimes you will see some of them are a little yellowish and they get crusted as they break over open and their, their fluid dries out. There can be a few people that will have scar formation. Uh, I had friends growing up that most of us had at least one little little defect uh, on our skin, our arms or our face, that was chicken pox. And pox, remember, is, um, is sort of a low version of the original pox, which was syphilis. So uh, when in Roman times you said to somebody, a pox be upon you, that was a really serious thing to say to somebody. Um, and But this because of some of the scar formation that this uh, develops, there was a similarity in people's early, in the early uh, discovery of this disease that uh, looked like the pox of, chick, uh, of syphilis, the skin rash, the uh, syphilitic skin. Sometimes uh, this, this is a disease that will affect the head and neck area, but most of the time it's in the abdomen or, or in the chest area, back area. And so rather than the virus settling into the trigeminal nerve so that we can have a problem a long time later with trying to figure out why this patient has pain or they get a recurrence as shingles, it's usually on the chest and back area where these attacks occur. And the virus is in one of the spinal ganglia rather than in the uh, gasserian ganglia. And we have a, a recent, uh, this is off a of TV, they're advertising the antiviral medication for shingles. 
uh, and I did check it, and it is uh, supposedly uh, true, at least from the federal, our federal government's perspective, that one out of four of us will have shingles in our country. In part, that's because we're living longer, and uh, this is uh, shingles is an old person's disease. I think it has to do with uh, immune surveillance as you get older. That, that system gets a little sloppy and less effect, effective, and so it tends to come back. Um, I had probably, uh, I think altogether, I had 16 aunts and uncles, and I think all but three of them had uh, shingles that, that I can remember sometime in their later life. And shingles, of course, is the recurrence, and it's always many, many decades, not always, but almost always, many, many decades after the primary attack, of course. Well, there can be oral lesions. There's no particular place that they are found. They're small in number, and uh, they are generally bilateral. If you have multiple lesions, you'll see them on left and right, whereas, remember, the classic recurrence of this is unilateral. Only one nerve is involved. And uh, that doesn't mean you can't have both of the, the trigeminal nerves uh, causing vesicle formation in adult lives. But usually it's on one side, and that's one way you try to separate this disease from some of the other blistering problems that can occur. I've already talked about small numbers of vesicles. Uh, eight would be, in my experience, a lot. The vesicles are pretty, not painless, but they don't really cause a lot of pain in individuals. One of the unusual things that I've seen twice or three times now, and, and that's only because people don't bring me chicken pox cases. Other people can make that diagnosis, so I don't get those kinds of patients that much. But I have seen several gingival blisters that cause a secondary infection. I don't know if it's, I assume it's bacterial. And it produced a cupped out kind of a uh, destruction. And uh, vesicles, like any, other, any of these vesicles, if you break the top off, the bottom is not cupped out. They're, they're flat across. So even if there's an ulcer and you don't, even, you don't see anything of the blister itself but the base, as long as it's flat, the diagnosis is okay. If you see something that has produced a bunch of little ulcers and they're cupped out, that's a destruction that virus doesn't produce. So maybe you, in that case, would be dealing with that herpetiform canker sore, aphistomatitis. We don't get scar formation in the mouth, at least it's not been reported. And really, there aren't too many look-alike lesions, um, except um, the kinds of things that are routine and I don't think you would really miss. I mentioned earlier that uh, sometimes we'll get these little bubbles at the outside of a fistula from a dental periapical abscess and they can be clear as well. Usually um, that to me is actually one of the miracles of the human body, uh, the fact that you can get pus dripping from a tooth directly into the middle of the bone marrow, and where does that pus go if it's gonna go anywhere? It makes a little hole out through the toughest layer possible, and that's the cortex right by that tooth. In every other bone, I spent a year at the Mayo Clinic studying bone pathology, and it was when we saw osteomyelitis or suppurative destruction of leg bones, that whole bone was destroyed. I've never heard of that happening in the jaws. And there again, just like the trigeminal system, we are dentists, we, we, we're in that area all the time, we don't even think about it relative to the nerve, we don't think about it relative to the bone either. We pull teeth and leave a rotted periodontal ligament, or we, we sometimes don't even cure it, a periapical abscess. And some of those abscesses, if there's a fistula, it, it'll drain forever uh, without ever closing over. Matter of fact, the earliest dentist, if you go back to the 1800s, the mid-1800s, if they had a tooth that was dead, they would drill a little hole. They would push down the marginal gingiva and drill a hole to let the pus out because then they knew the pain would disappear. And then that marginal gingiva would act as a, a flap. When the pus got built up too much, it would push the marginal gingiva open and release. And that was a dental treatment, making our own little holes in teeth. That's quite a different, that was a sideline, uh, but it's uh, still a very interesting thing that we're dealing with a bone that is by far the most unique bone in the whole skeleton. 
and it's because of uh, the nerves in the area, and it's because of the teeth in the area, of course. But I don't think you would get too much uh, confusion with a, a perilous. So most, most dentists don't really get involved in chicken pox because the mothers, uh, if not the fathers, know what the disease is. And, of course, now we have vaccinations. But uh, we do get involved with the adult recurrence. And herpes zoster can imitate a tooth very, very easily. People will come in and say, this tooth hurts, and you won't see any kind of periapical radiolucency, but it hurts when you pound on the tooth, uh, tap on it a little bit. And if you don't do a proper pulp testing procedure, then you might even pull that tooth uh, in, on the assumption that the pain is coming from the tooth. And then uh, we get these vesicles popping up. So that might be a day or two after your extraction. That's one scenario. Another scenario is you pull a tooth because it is legitimately dead and that's a proper treatment for that tooth. But the trauma that you've put into that area causes herpes zoster to recur. That's not so, so unusual to have that scenario. And as a matter of fact, there are several papers, probably dozens by now, of cases where a tooth was pulled and the bone around it all died because there was so much infection. The, the virus induced so much infection that the inflammatory response made clotting excessive and the bone would die. Uh, would die. We get osteonecrosis. Uh, whole maxillae, whole alveolar chunks of bone have sloughed off because the dentist pulled a tooth and stimulate herpes zoster. There's no way you can know, no way you can predict. You can't, you just have to do your routine thing. But um, that is one of the side effects, one of the downsides of some of the things that we do. Uh, this is uh, something that I told you that one out of four of us are going to get this. This, if you look in the literature, not the federal government stuff, but the, in the actual literature, they're saying that 20 to 30 percent of us will have a herpes, uh, in, a herpes zoster attack in our lifetime. Fortunately, it's usually one attack, but two, three, four percent of people will get it as a recurrence, and it could be a regular recurrence several times a year, maybe in a woman tied to her menstrual cycle, that sort of thing. But um, that is some piece of assurance for somebody going through the pain of this kind of a process. Let them know that you're going to have this once and you won't have to go through it again. And uh, there, because of the pain involved in this and because the pain is often pretty severe even as the vesicles are forming or before the vesicles are forming, then these things like uh, valcyclovir and acyclovir, they will work. They'll be more effective. They might reduce the pain. They will reduce the pain immediately. But more importantly, they will reduce the pain, uh, the potential for uh, post-neuralgic, uh, post-herpetic pain. One of the odd things about all of these viral infections, especially herpes zoster, is that uh, until about 20 years ago, we said, do not ever, 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 ever put a steroid on these lesions, even a topical steroid, because the immune system is just barely able to contain this process. You've just reduced the immune system locally or systemically, and so you might cause this whole thing to spread. Well, if you have herpes zoster of the, the back, uh, of the abdomen, or the chest, what is a dermatologist going to do to prevent post pain or do once the post pain starts? They inject high doses of corticosteroid directly into the nerve. And I don't know who was the first person. I haven't really researched that, but I don't know who the first neurologist was or dermatologist who did that, but that took a lot of guts. I just can't imagine. Uh, and now, So now I don't know what to say about steroids. I think we, we still use that as our standard dogma. Do not use steroids with any of these lesions. I mentioned with uh, the sun poisoning of the lower lip that steroid is really the only treatment and even that isn't very effective. But you don't really use that until after a couple weeks when you're sure it's not a herpes simplex problem. Herpes zoster can be triggered by a lot of things. Chemotherapy, it's one of the horrible things that happen 
happens uh, with some frequency in chemotherapeutic patients because the immune system can no longer contain the virus and keep it in the gang ganglia. Alcohol abuse is um, probably the liver damage is the mechanism there. So you have to be fairly far, far along in your alcohol abuse before you, uh, it, uh, you have a drinking bout that will end up with uh, shingles. Malignancy, it's not, no matter where in the body, usually it's an abdominal or thoracic type of malignancy. Uh, and the first sign is you've got herpes. You, I mean, you've got uh, shingles somewhere in the body, usually in the chest region, but it could be in the face. And I've talked about extractions. Of course, any kind of immune suppression, which is what chemotherapy often does. Irradiation, the two most common reasons, the two most common reasons for stopping radiation for tongue cancer, for example, at least in the MD Anderson experience, is uh, radiation mucositis, where the, the membranes of the mouth break down, ulcerate, become hugely painful, so the patient cannot stand any more of that radiation. The other thing is this process. They'll, they'll develop a very serious uh, shingles attack. And of course, uh, just getting old. Uh, we can't avoid that. Most of us will make it to an older age. And the older you are, the more susceptible you are to getting a herpes attack. The, the key feature that us, uh, that we in the dental profession have to keep in mind is we, we can have shingles in the mouth. We can have shingles in the mouth and on the skin following the same branch of the trigeminal. And most of the time, at least in my experience and from talking and reading about this, it's intraoral. That's what the dentists deal with. I think it's because if it's outside as well as inside, the dermatologist gets those patients. But we have to look very carefully to make sure that there are no blisters either on the inner campus of the eye or up here in the inner portion of the eyebrow or on the bridge of the nose because that means first branch involvement, and that means you must refer that patient immediately to an eye doc, an ophthalmologist, because this can end up in blindness. Herpes zoster affecting the eye can end up in permanent blindness of that eye. So it's another thing that what you see in the mouth might be pretty innocuous. You might not even see anything in the mouth. You're just looking at a patient who happens to have come in for a routine exam. And then you see this little crusting vesicle, a broken vesicle above the uh, eye. And that is reason to send them off to um, um, their, their eye doc. Uh, sometimes this can occur as well inside the inner ear. And as a matter of fact, uh, from people who I have talked with, uh, it's, it's literally an unbearable pain when it occurs inside your, your ear, your um, uh, the middle ear, anyway. And uh, you, it's pretty unbearable having it on your chest or on your abdomen or on your back. But in the ear or in the eye are the most serious forms as far as uh, um, symptoms. Fever, malaise, uh, sort of feeling worn out, uh, these uh, and headache, these are all part and parcel of lots of... We all feel that from time to time. Usually it's an upper respiratory infection, but we don't have any kind of vesicular formation. And here we have a patient with involvement of a couple of branches. That's not so unusual to have a couple of branches. It's usually uh, the second and third branch, but here we have somebody with the first and second branch involved. And, uh, but if you have the same kind of thing going on on the other side, there are some herpes simplex case, or herpes zoster cases that are bilateral, but it's, you, you should be really worried about either the wrong diagnosis or that immune status in that setting. So, uh, let's see. Oh, you could have a patient come in. They had their herpes of the face maybe six months ago. Now they're in your office because every tooth in that maxillary arch on this side hurts. They can't even chew on that side. And if you pulp tested the teeth, they would all be viable. They would be alive and well. But they all hurt, especially when the patient bites down. That is a presentation of post-herpetic pain. And if it comes on in a short duration, it might be the presentation before you even get vesicles in the mouth or on the face. So the presence or absence of the vesicles isn't really necessary for a full-blown herpes uh, uh, zoster attack. I want to say that um, 
Not a full blown uh, post herpetic pain attack. Yeah. Could you see if it's severe? Uh, could you see seizures? Can you get seizures? Well, this, as with the uh, herpes simplex, I don't think I mentioned it, but encephalitis and meningitis is not nearly as big a problem with this as with herpes simplex. But if they do happen to get that, then they could have seizures as part of that phenomenon. That's a very severe sign or symptom, I guess. Ah, seizure is something you can look at, so it must be a sign. The question uh, was, and I don't know if I repeated it, uh, can you get seizures with this? And it's pretty unusual, but you can. So uh, herpes uh, zoster, another thing your patient is going to want to know is when is this going to be over? And with a herpes simplex, you can tell them, well, you know, about day five, maybe even day four, the pain will start to go away and the blisters should disappear by seven or eight days. Uh, this goes on a little bit longer. The vesicles themselves look identical to the herpes simplex vesicles. They're just tiny things, flat base. Sometimes you'll have uh, several of them clustered so tightly together that they look like they're producing one large ulcer. But if you look carefully at the outer edge, you'll see that there are a bunch of little scalloped areas because they're, these are the outer uh, blisters that have broken open. This was a patient, actually it's the same patient, just a little different uh, uh, reproduction, I guess, when I copied them. But this is a patient sent to me with a classic herpes presentation in the mouth. Uh, the, the dentist thought that this was a soup burn. The patient had had French onion soup and the cheese stuck to the roof of his mouth. And uh, of course, naturally, he thought this was a burn. But you don't get soup burn with tons of little uh, scattered tiny vesicles, each with a little round red halo. Uh, soup burn would be much more localized and it would be a little bit um, deeper. Um, destruction of the ulcer bed. But that is what produced the herpes zoster. It, it, uh, it was trauma, thermal trauma in this case, it triggered. And that's uh, not so unusual. Um, this is, I've already talked about the fact that uh, the, the latest case was out of Holland and that was something similar to this, but it got into the underlying bone and remember the nerve, the trigeminal nerve is in the bone as well as out here on the surface of the mucosa. So uh, that those viruses can jump out everywhere. They can't, they don't have to jump out just at the very end of the nerve. And so that is easily explained, but when zoster gets into the bone, it seems to stimulate this clotting and I think it's the clotting that kills off the bone. But, um, you know, to have a uh, herpes attack is bad enough, but to have it develop to the point where they have to remove half of your alveolus, uh, that is, that's just beyond what anybody should have to have. post neuralgia, we've already talked about. Uh, I didn't really say how frequently that is, but it's somewhere between 10 and 15% of all the cases of herpes zoster will end up with that. So it's, it's worth knowing about. And post neuralgia or post pain is a very severe problem. The good news is that uh, you can tell people, chances are this will be all over in a year. Um, it really doesn't help much to use painkillers unless you go up to morphine. Uh, but uh, that's something that a patient is just going to have to tough it out and live with. But there are people who literally go the rest of their lives in that kind of pain. And maybe those are people who were misdiagnosed, but still there, there are lots of people in our literature that have had very, very long duration of this kind of pain. And sometimes instead of pain, uh, the face, facial nerve gets involved and we have paralysis, um, like a Bell's palsy. But if you tie that with vertigo because the ear is involved, then Ramsey-Hunt syndrome is the combination of those two things. So those are just uh, sort of the, the bad things that can happen with a shingles attack above and beyond the normal. And those are really the, um, the, the, the vesicles that you'll run into more frequently than otherwise. Uh, when my two boys are, one is 40, the other is 38, but I used to read them bedtime stories. And uh, actually, that wasn't the reason I did it, but I always had a flashlight with me, and before I tucked them in, I would 
look in their mouths for that herpes simplex attack. And uh, one, one just had a red gingivitis on one, one half of the mandible, and the other had two little vesicles with a mild gingivitis. And that was, I think that's a pretty standard way that most of us get those. Uh, I mentioned Coxsackie virus, uh, named after a little city in New York. And how many, how many cities can say they've got two diseases named after them? But um, that's, that is the case, and these diseases all came out of the same uh, grade school or elementary school. Herpangina is the, uh, the first one that was uh, produced. It was an epidemic. Virtually every kid in the school got herpangina. And then the next year, virtually every kid got hand, foot, and mouth disease. And I was in dental school shortly thereafter, maybe eight years or so after hand, foot, and mouth was first uh, discovered in this town. And there was so little known about hand, foot, and mouth disease that when one of our patients came down with it, two patients of one dental student, they shut down the entire school for three weeks. Um, now, to shut down a dental school for three weeks, I've never heard of that happening anywhere else. And, uh, but that's how frightened we were. We didn't know if people were going to get brain damage from this virus. We didn't know anything about it. Now we know it's a very, very well-controlled virus. Uh, you, you go through your little bout of disease, and you are very contagious at the time, but it doesn't really cause major damage. Um, uh, very seldom will it do that. So let's look at uh, herpangina. Angina, of course, means pain, and uh, herp means these little vesicles, herpes-like vesicles, and that's just kind of a classic appearance. But this is very, very much uh, anatomically oriented. Hand, foot, and mouth is in front of the first molars. The herp angina is behind the first molars. It may actually be on the posterior pharyngeal wall, but most of it is soft palate, essentially. And you get these tiny little cauliflower-looking pustules. And they're, they're moderately tender, but they're almost never painful enough for the patient to go to a doctor. And as with herpes simplex, most primary attacks, well, this doesn't have a secondary attack, but most primary attacks are pretty mild. So you just have a scratchy voice. Um, you know, I've got an extremely dry mouth problem and my throat gets dry, and that becomes painful when I talk like this for too long. Um, but, and so for me, I wouldn't think twice if I had a sore throat. It'd have to be very severe. And these are kids who are teenagers, uh, adolescents, and so they've got other things on their mind, and they've had sore throats, and this is no big deal. This is a Coxsackie. It's the Coxsackie A virus. Usually it's subtypes one through six, but really... I think there is something like 31 Coxsackie viruses that have been found so far. Uh, they're almost like as bad as papillomavirus. So we're up to 170 papillomaviruses subtypes. But here we have uh, the sore throat, a little bit of difficulty or pain on swallowing. Low-grade fever is usually part of it, but it might be so low that you don't even know you have a fever. And almost all cases are really pretty mild. It's really unusual to have more than a dozen vesicles in this disease, so small numbers are part of the disease process, and that bilateral nature is a key. This crosses the midline, so you're not thinking about herpes zoster anymore. And there are, they are a little spread out, and they do, in fact, uh, represent blisters that have been broken open. Oh, I should have mentioned that I just discovered this uh, last year, that there is an enterovirus foundation. Uh, just doing research in, in these few, disease, uh, these few uh, viral diseases. Herpangina is uh, usually like every other viral infection. Before the blister, you see a little red patch there, and then you see a little white dot that bulges out into a blister, a clear blister, but it breaks very, very fast. These are just like herpes simplex in their biological behavior. They, they break, there's a little bit of pain. Herpes simplex is usually much, much more painful, but... This is over and done with within generally five, six, seven, eight days. And uh, usually the pain is only for a couple of days. And then once that is over, you've got permanent immunity. And there is, uh, at least I couldn't find, the last time I checked, which was last year, I couldn't find a case of anybody who had recurring herpangina. So it's a one-shot deal. Uh, the 
biggest problem is a kind of confusion with another entity that is very, very poorly defined. Uh, probably going back to the 1920s, there has been this disease where people would get ulceration of their these little tonsil tags, especially in the posterior pharynx and the soft palate. And we called that lymphonodular pharyngitis, for want of a better term. I think these are probably herpangina cases that just happen to have the ulcers, some of them on top of these tonsil tags. I don't know that for sure, but this is, uh, we put it in our textbook, I believe, but we really were kind of reluctant because we don't know if it's a special disease or not. But if you, if you do see ulcers on top of the, the uh, tonsil tags, you'd kind of expect these tags to be big now, right? Because you've got a sore throat, and that's what lymphoid tissue does. It proliferates in, if you have a problem locally. So um, I think that's the problem, but I can't really prove that. I'll just say don't be surprised if you have some blisters on top of that. And here's another example. I think this is the textbook picture. So you see these little vesicles almost like uh, right on top of the little tonsil tags, which are red and enlarged because that's their nature. So um, I think we've already talked about all of this, uh, that we do know that this is associated with the Coxsackie A virus as well, but it's a little different subtype from the normal. Um, whether that makes it a separate disease or not, I don't really know. Is there anything that looks like this? Not much. Uh, if you're really not too well trained, you might miss a, a, a short-term um, inflammatory papillary hyperplasia. But that's always on the hard palate. It's under a denture that makes, or it's in somebody who's a heavy mouth breather. So that makes a differential kind of easy. Herpangina is a soft palate, but uh, you can have multiple early bumps, if you will, uh, that are clear from a denture trauma. And eventually they'll become fibrotic and each one will be like a little irritation fibroma. But for the first several months, they're almost completely reversible because they're all fluid. They're just edema. I can't think of anything else that would look like this. And the kissing cousin, uh, almost literally kissing cousin of this is the hand, foot, and mouth disease. Hand, foot, and mouth disease is something that um, is spread not only by saliva, but by a lot of other bodily fluids. And uh, so it's a disease that can be spread even more quickly. Remember I told you that Coxsackie, we're almost always, all of us have antibodies against it. And half a century ago, it wasn't even existing. And so that's how fast it has spread and it's spread around the globe. We get a lot of these diseases. These are a little more obvious, a little more painful, so they're diagnosed usually by physicians and uh, pediatricians, and so we, the gov our government estimates we get about 15 million new cases every year, and those are just the ones that are severe enough to go to a doctor to, to uh, cause a report to be made. And then every once in a while in communities all over America, things happen just like the Coxsackie. You'll have a, a town in Arizona that hasn't had anybody infected for 10 years. They get a new kid in the school, and that kid passes it around to everybody, and the whole school gets it. Uh, so it's a, a very uh, contagious disease. There, are, there is some evidence, maybe not the strongest, that uh, it is associated with increased type 1 diabetes, whether there's a cause and effect, uh, we don't know, but it may be that this is a causative feature for type 1 diabetes. But the mechanism is totally unknown right now. This is maybe a, a more concern. Uh, well, type 1 is pretty serious, but a cardiomyopathy is almost a, a cardiomegaly where the heart starts to enlarge. And there are several other viral diseases that we don't deal with in dentistry at all that can do that same thing to a heart. So that might be a, another cause, cause and effect problem. There have been some people that have had herpangina and hand, foot, and mouth disease combined. So that's going to fool you. I don't think I would think of that if I saw a patient. I would only know when we did cultures of uh, these vesicles and we found we have two subtypes. Oh, I, I wanted to say um, this is very classic. We have a very small number of vesicles. There usually is a little bit of mild uh, red halo inflammatory response around them. The older ones 
older meaning a few days old, uh, they're broken and you don't have so much inflammatory response. It's, it's just like as soon as this vesicle occurs, the disease is done. And it's from that point on, it starts to heal. If you get uh, four, five, six little vesicles of the anterior vestibular or labial area, then I think you've got the diagnosis, especially if it crosses the midline. I wouldn't bother working it up and getting a, any kind of a culture because that, that is expensive and this is going to go away. All of the lesions that you can think of would be gone uh, except for herpes zoster in a, a week's time. So I've had quite a few hand, foot, and mouth patients that I've diagnosed over the years, and I don't think, except in the early years, I don't think I've bothered to culture any of them. It's a clinical diagnosis, and you know what that means. <laughs> that means it's your job, not mine. Uh, you're certainly welcome, as so many people do nowadays, to take a picture, uh, send it to one of us in this business. Uh, we usually don't mind that, uh, especially if you're old students of ours. And I actually enjoy it because then I can get some pictures that uh, I can use in uh, future lectures and things. So that helps to make a diagnosis. Uh, for, it helps you if you're stuck. Don't confuse it with this. There is a uh, hoof and mouth disease. Uh, a lot of people still think that this is a disease that is passed on to humans from the cows or the pigs. And it really isn't. Um, hand, uh, hoof and mouth disease is a pretty serious disease. Some cows have to be slaughtered. And, of course, can't eat the meat uh, if they have a disease like this. So uh, they have to be put down. And, of course, anybody in academics knows about the foot and mouth disease because it's almost a daily event in most of our lives. Uh, Americans, I know, are especially known and especially prone to foot and mouth disease. We just put our foot in our mouth because we say such silly things. Well, I think we've already talked about all of this. Um, the other, other areas of involvement, as the name should surely tell you, are the hands and feet. And there are small numbers of vesicles. They usually are on the palm side or the, the sole side of the foot. But here we see other surfaces involved as well. They might just be little red dots, or they might be actual pustules that you can see. They'd be slightly tender to touch. And with any, as with any other disease, you might have only oral involvement. You might have only hand involvement. You might have only foot involvement. But it's all the same disease, and your immunity is going to be the same no matter how much involvement you have. Uh, let's see. We've already taken care of, I think, all of that. More examples, uh, close-up of the pustules, and uh, some that go as high as the ankle. I've really not heard of this going higher than that point, and this is pretty classic, just a few little vesicles on the inside of the lower lip. And that, that kind of gives you, you, you ought to have a feel now for what to think about if you see a tiny little vesicle. Uh, you have the list in the, the must-know oral lesions. You have that list of vesicles, and uh, most of those are viruses. I think I, I also put that little list of pseudo-vesicles down there for you. But there is another virus that uh, causes a lot of problems for us. A lot of heads are being scratched, and I thought that even though it doesn't produce blisters, I should give you a little uh, review of, of this particular virus. This is one of the hottest viruses in scientific research today, if not the hottest. This is a disease, a uh, human papillomavirus. I think I told you yesterday that nobody really could study it much because we had no technology to isolate it. And now we have tons of technology that is going to take care of this, hopefully. Well, do we get much of this in the mouth? Remember, this is the virus that produces epithelial cancers. This is the virus that produces supposedly 95% of all of the cancers of the uterine cervix. And that's a pretty serious cancer. It also is a virus. It also is the virus involved in a lot of the precancers of the uh, head and neck area as well as the cervix. So keep in mind, uh, GYN, they no longer, in the United States anyway, use the word leukoplakia for those white patches of the cervix. They call them HPV lesions. And there's a variety of appearances, but the typical one is a white patch. 
Well, uh, we have lots of subtypes. I've already mentioned that. And if we look at oral involvement, we have lots of different diseases that are produced by this one virus, things that we thought were totally different etiologies now are very much combined, and as a matter of fact, especially in HIV and particularly in AIDS patients, these kinds of lesions are really, really common in the mouth. We have, uh, in Houston, we have the largest uh, head and neck or oral HIV clinic in the country, and it's actually all run by volunteers. Uh, not volunteers, but all the funding comes from private sources. It's not a government clinic. And they send us, uh, we do their biopsies almost for free, and we get a lot of them. And they send us HPV lesions virtually every day. Uh, they're seeing this in their patient pool. One of the things that is kind of scary about this virus is if you biopsy just normal mucosa, I kind of alluded to that with a, a population of people who already have oral cancer. Uh, but even if you take just you and me, and biopsy our buccal mucosa. That's a hard thing to get through your institutional review board, by the way. Uh, if you're going to biopsy normal looking stuff for just uh, curiosity's sake. But if you did that, these are the viruses. Everything in yellow has been isolated in at least one third of these biopsy samples. So we have six and 11 that are seen in at least one third of our mouths normally. What the six do? Six is the papilloma-producing virus. Eleven, now we start to get into a little bit of leukoplakia and also some uh, sexually transmitted diseases. So maybe that's a little more concerned, but it is not thought to be a very high uh, cancer producer. But these two, these are the sort of the granddaddies of the papilloma virus picture. They're the ones most often associated with cancers, cancer production. And in the cervix, this is, uh, well, we have a new vaccine, a very controversial thing in our country against the HPV, and it is specifically against HPV 16 and 18, and a couple of others that are lesser associated with cancer production. So the controversy is not whether it works or not. We just have a bunch of people that think it's government interference to be giving us vaccines, and there's a certain validity to that, I guess. Um, but the main controversy is we're giving it to young girls on the assumption that they are going to get all these sexually transmitted diseases. And so being politically correct, I think we're going to end up now giving it to boys and girls. Um, and so we, we will hopefully prevent all of these from happening in the future. That vaccine has only been used for the past two or three years in our country. So, in normal mucosa, those of us, uh, about a third of us will have 16 and 18. Are we the people who are prone to getting cancer of the mouth? Remember yesterday I mentioned cancer of the mouth is a multi-step process. You have to have the genes. First of all, you have to have some kind, something that we don't know about in your genes that makes you susceptible. And then maybe you have to have this in your cells of your membranes. And who knows what else you need. We can get warts in the mouth. We don't see them very often, and when we do, they're usually in kids, but uh, that's usually number two. And that was the only virus that we could identify with our technology prior to the, the PCR invention. And now we've got, I mentioned, it's up to 170 different ones. We have uh, condyloma, which is uh, used to be thought, it's a venereal disease, sexually transmitted disease. It looks a bit like a wart, but a condyloma is, in fact, something that was once thought to be part of syphilis. Remember, I said if you have one sexually transmitted disease, you really have three. That's the average. So people who have this, have syphilis, had a lot of papillomavirus as well. And now we know that condyloma has nothing at all to do with syphilis. It's just that... If you're having sex with a bunch of diseased people, then you're going to get a bunch of diseases, including the papillomavirus. Hex disease uh, is a virus that was first identified in kids in Greenland. Uh, they just they went, they had epidemics, and they couldn't find them in adults, so they, it produced these little bumps in the mouth, and they were gone in adults. So 
it seemed like an odd type of thing that would occur. Uh, one of my teachers in um, Minnesota was a guy named Carl Whitcup. There are a couple of diseases called Whitcup diseases. But he first identified this virus. He went to Greenland. He was working for NIH. And he found this virus in these kids. And so he wrote a paper. And his uh, research partner was Dr. Heck. And his research partner didn't write a paper with him. He said, no, I don't think it's worth writing. But secretly, <laughs> his research part partner wrote a paper real quick and got it in first. So uh, now we call it Heck's disease instead of Whitcup disease. And nevertheless, um, that's a little history behind that. And now we, we find it in all populations. We find it in American Indians. We find it in Latinos. We find it in Northern European whites in and out of America. So it's in all populations. We don't find any of the uh, 16 and 18 virus in smokeless tobacco keratosis. Maybe that's why it isn't such a, a bad acting precancer. We do find it, uh, we start to see it in low numbers in leukoplakia that doesn't have any bad cells, but once we start to get dysplasia, now we start to see them. And then we see them in uh, the more serious diseases as well, carcinoma and Bruca's carcinoma. So 16 and 18 is a pretty common thing in our world, and it, they are related to malignancies. And this is a virus that also produces this proliferation, a funny proliferation. Normal tissue, if there's going to be a little tumor, it will be either with a broad base or on a stalk, and it's going to be smooth on the surface. But once we get this virus in there, we start to get pointed projections and finger-like or blunted projections, sometimes on a stalk, sometimes broad base, and all of this is papilloma-induced. And uh, we don't know exactly what the mechanism is. It, the virus does, in fact, take over the DNA of these cells, and the new epithelium is different. Let's go through just a few of these to give you a, a quick impression. Uh, the papilloma is the one, certainly, that's the most common. Uh, we see 6 and 11 as the virus that's involved, but look what it does. It will take a perfectly smooth mucous membrane and not only produce proliferation of the epithelium, but look at each one of these little finger-like projections has connective tissue in it. So the virus not only takes over the epithelium, it somehow controls the connective tissue and tells it, well, as we grow, I want you to keep on giving us this, uh, the blood vessels and all the nutrition we need. That's a pretty intelligent move. I mean, it's a very humble lesion, but it's a pretty intelligent move. And uh, sometimes uh, we have very pointed projections, very white surfaces because of all the thick keratin. Other times we have less whiteness and uh, more blunted surfaces. But the papilloma is something that um, was so common that uh, remember I mentioned that early uh, white patches were called leukoplakia. And the very first journal of the American Dental Association had a review article of leukoplakia. And the drawing they have is a classic papilloma. Uh, there was no leukoplakia in any of the pictures in that article. So, uh, but that's where we started from. What happens, I mean, if you have a wart, you bite. That happened to my brother when we were young. He had a wart on his finger. He bit it, and he got a wart here on his lip. Or you can spread it. You can auto-inoculate. Does that happen with papilloma? It's really... I mean, I, when I explain what it is to my patients, I say this is a wart in your mouth. Uh, the trouble is, the difference is, uh, this is not very contagious. It has to be contagious somehow because we do get them, but uh, it's not like a wart at all. You don't spread it around to else, other parts of the body. You can have a patient uh, take a papilloma and cut it off with their fingers, fingernails, or twist it off. and. Uh, it really won't make any difference. Uh, recurrence will be very, very minimal, and there's no spread. So this is um, more like a neoplasm than a true uh, viral infection. The ones that are foolers are those on, that are found on tissues that don't have a lot of keratin to begin with, like the soft palate. And those don't have much keratin themselves, and they can be pointed or blunted. And here we have one that was just barely visible. I had one papilloma that was right on the uvula, 
And it must have been there a long time because the patient had been swallowing it with every swallow for years. And now it was on a stalk that was three centimeters long. And right on the end of it was the papilloma. So essentially this patient had been swallowing this papilloma for years. There can be squamous cancers that are papillary. We call them papillary squamous cell carcinoma. They are, in fact, a worse kind of cancer than the regular squamous cell carcinomas. But if you happen to catch one when it's very small, remember carcinoma in the mouth grows pretty slowly, nine months, 12 months before somebody is worried enough to go to see a doc, and maybe even as much as two years before that happens. So there are look-alike lesions that uh, are, in fact, pretty serious, and I think that's why papillomas are removed and sent off for biopsy interpretation because of this possibility. All you have to do is ask your patient, how long has that been there? And if, it's, if they know and it's been there more than a couple of years, then uh, you don't have to really do anything. It's already reached its maximum size. They reach maximum size in a matter of months, and they don't grow after that. And they might enlarge a little bit if they get uh, chomped on or bit uh, and temporarily inflamed, but other than that, they don't grow. So here we have an example of a squamous cell carcinoma that doesn't look nearly as bad <laughs> as a papilloma. And uh, so don't go by size, uh, but go by that history. That's, if, if you get beyond two years that something's been there, you're okay. I, I shouldn't say this because I'm, I'm a pathologist, but you don't have to biopsy. You can make a clinical diagnosis. There is a papilloma that is a type of papilloma that is much more severe. It is ironically not so much related to the papilloma virus, but it is in, in some regard. This is a drawing I found from an old ENT journal from the 1860s, uh, and it is a problem in particular because they tend to grow on the vocal cords, and there's not a lot of room there. And they tend to be multiple and proliferate, and because of that, it's called papillomatosis. And when we see it in the mouth, it is multiple, and it is called oral florid papillomatosis, or since it's in kids more frequently nowadays, we just say juvenile papillomatosis. Well, what do you do if you get a bunch of papillomas in the mouth? Number one, you have to make sure it's not related to something else. And here's a short list. Ichthyosis hystrix, uh, you probably haven't heard of that. I was a resident before I heard of it. But ichthyosis hystrix is, ichthyosis is like fish scales. Uh, and these are the people who have such thick keratin that they look like they have snake skin, really. And when I was a child, uh, we would go to the Minnesota State Fair, and they always had a sideshow of people who were, we called them freaks at that time, and we would pay a, a nickel to go and see somebody. And I went, I had to see someone who looked like a snake, so I paid my nickel. And it was some, just some poor lady with uh, a skin disorder is all it amounted to. But those people have this kind of a tongue. So it might be, all you would have to do would be to check the skin to see if it is thicker, more calloused, uh, has a, sort of a dry, white, scaly look to it or ask if they uh, have such thick skin that when they walk, they, they get cracks in the, the soles of their feet. And uh, usually when we have that kind of a thing in the mouth, it doesn't look like thick keratin. It isn't, it isn't heavily keratinized. It looks like a bunch of little papillomas. But we have a name. It's usually on one side, so it's called a nevus, a mark, unius on one side, unius lateralis. And it's on the lateral side of the tongue. There are a few other diseases. Acanthosis nigricans is worth picking up in a patient because that has a 50% chance of developing a stomach cancer, those patients do. Tuberous sclerosis is something that we can't really treat very well, but can end with severe mental retardation. So at least it would be good to have that early on diagnosed. So maybe it's not so good to know that that's going to happen to you. Focal dermal hypoplasia is a, uh, just a disease that leaves some areas that look like skin that isn't really there. It's an ulcerated area. And uh, microscopically it's there, but it looks like an ulcer. And they can have these same kinds of things in the mouth. 
So when, when we're dealing with multiple papillomas, then we have a whole different ball game to deal with uh, or to think about. And then probably in today's world, uh, this is the biggest thing that you have to rule out. Um, is it a, a condyloma, a sexually transmitted disease, or is it a papilloma, which is not sexually transmitted? At least we don't think so. Um, condylomas have uh, lots of different kinds of papillomaviruses associated with them, but classically they have some differences clinically that can help you. They have a broad base, even though there's a little bit of a stalk, it is tucked in, excuse me, at the margins, and each projection is just a little, in America we call them nubbins, just a tiny little bump. And they're very seldom heavily keratinized, so they're not white at all, like many papillomas. So broad base, short bumps on the surface, very little keratinization. You might see a little white dot on the tops of each of these little bumps. And if you look carefully, you dry it out a bit with some air and look at it, it looks almost as if it's translucent. Not all of them, but many of them, as if you can see into it. I don't know where that comes from, but that's the appearance. And microscopically, we have blunt projections. There is a connective tissue core going up into each one, but it's mostly just uh, hyperplastic epithelium. And we could, I suppose, uh, stain for some of these HPVs, but we don't because it doesn't seem to be valid to do that as routine. It's okay for research, but not for routine diagnosis. So we can't really tell a condyloma from a papilloma unless it's really classic. And uh, in Houston, in Houston we've got, it's a big city, six million people. We have a fair amount of sexually transmitted disease going on. And so we get a lot of cases, probably on a weekly basis. I'm looking at one and I'm just asking myself, could this be a sexually transmitted disease or not? And quite frankly, I hate to admit it, but because that we, we get into that social issue, uh, I often will go on the side of the papilloma because then I don't have to be bothered, but that's, uh, that's being cowardly. <laughs> um, I don't really do that that often, but every once in a while I think that I have actually done it that way. So I'm giving a politically correct diagnosis rather than a good, good diagnosis. One of the things that's different about condylomas is they're very frequently multiple in the mouth. Condylomas occur at the source of physical contact from oral sex, oral genital sex. And so the tongue gets used fairly uh, extensively in that kind of activity, so the frenulum is going to, the frenum is going to get uh, traumatized. And then uh, as the saliva gets mixed, you're going to end up with a papilloma developing. You need a mild trauma in order to get a condyloma. The other uh, trauma site is from the midline of the soft palate over to the side, and that's because of fellatio. And then, uh, also, you can get the same kinds of things, uh, believe it or not, under a denture uh, because uh, people, especially women, do not take, uh, or they take their dentures out during that activity. And then they'll put the dentures in and the virus is sort of trapped up in there. That's speculation. Nobody's really done a study to prove all that. But nevertheless, condyloma is it's significantly different because it's so much more contagious. If you find a condyloma in a very young child, then you have to think about sexual abuse from the parents or some family member or a neighbor, and that's a whole different issue entirely. And uh, there is, a, in the genital area, condylomas are considered to be pre-malignant. There have only been, as far as I know, two condylomas of the mouth that have gone on to become squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, I don't know if that was just by chance or maybe they were carcinomas with the first biopsy, but they just weren't proliferating enough or invading enough. But uh, we don't normally think of condylomas in the mouth as a pre-malignancy. What we're worried about, as they do in the genital area, what we're worried about is the contagion aspect of this. And just to give you a little bit of an interesting take, uh, this actually was one of my neighbors in West Virginia. She was, um, she was drunk pretty much all day long. Uh, her husband owned uh, several companies, corporations, and local radio station. 
quite well to do. She didn't have to do any work, and so she just sat around and drank all day. She's a very nice lady. But um, she came to me uh, one day, and she said, I've got this thing in my mouth. Would you look at it? And actually, you know, she was referred by her family dentist to me. Uh, the family dentist didn't know that we were neighbors. And I looked, and the dentist was worried that this was a squamous cell carcinoma. And I looked at it, and I said, well, it's kind of translucent in some areas. It's very sort of almost bubbly, these little nodules on the surface. And it is tucked in a little bit, so it's on a little bit of a stalk. So I was thinking, this is a condyloma, and I'm talking to my neighbor, so what do I say? And she's 72. Um, uh, at any rate, I had that conversation cut short because I f put my fingers over here, and that was as hard as a rock. And that is what killed her. She had squamous cell carcinoma. And the dentist didn't get his fingers in there to feel and didn't even pick up. And this dentist is a good dentist. He's an old friend of mine. And also, uh, she had uh, some leukoplakia and some red patches, uh, erythroplakia. And if you look carefully, I, you have to have some experience with this, but I think I can identify what I call alcoholic mucosa. It's very blotchy. You have little patches of red. The, the vessels seem to be more pronounced in some areas. You have these very pale areas mixed with patches of red again. And the red is vascular rather than uh, this erythema or this, this kind of smooth redness of the erythroplakia. Well, this was uh, at a time just after we had gotten our PCR. I was doing a research project with that. So uh, we biopsied. We took the condyloma off, and that had uh, HPV-16, which is now considered to be the premier cancer-producing subtype. And guess what the cancer had? HPV-16. Guess what the leukoplakia had? And guess what the erythroplakia had? So we have four different lesions in one person's mouth, all produced, supposedly produced, by one virus. Now, how does that happen? I can't figure it out. But uh, there must be other things involved in uh, making these different lesions. And the final thing will be talking about this Hex disease, or pseudo Witkoff's disease, if you want to use that terminology. Hex disease is... Um, well, it looks like that's a little fuzzy, but I think you can see these sort of flat-topped pink papules here. There you can see one, uh, just the edge of it. And uh, it looks much better on my screen than here, but that's what they look like. They, they can be either flat-topped, they're just uh, half a centimeter across or less, and they're either flat on the top or they have tiny little pebbling of the surface totally painless. You may have dozens or hundreds of them in, in a young kid's mouth. Usually there are probably about 20, 25, or 30 of them. And they come on fairly abruptly over a matter of weeks, maybe a couple of months, and then they're, they stay the same for several months, probably several years for most of them. This is a, a different kind of appearance. I have never seen this particular presentation, but a friend of mine did. And uh, so he, is, uh, he gave this picture to the rest of us. They're more rounded instead of flat-topped. And uh, you can see how many of these you can have in uh, some patients. This is a disease that produces multiple things that might be mistaken for condylomas. Um, none of these are a real problem. They don't creep out onto the vermilion border even, so it's not an aesthetic problem. It's just a funny thing that is seen in the mouths of some kids and goes away in a, a matter of uh, usually, uh, we'll say, a few years. Do we get warts in the mouth? I've already said yes, we get warts in the mouth, but they're very heavily keratinized. I've never seen a wart that wasn't white. And they can be pointed, and microscopically, that's the only way you're going to tell whether somebody has a wart or, or a papilloma. Warts are in kids. Kids spread their saliva everywhere, and so... Uh, the virus, we assume, is in the uh, saliva, and the uh, warts can be spread in that fashion. And they're pretty contagious. I won't get into the histologic differences, but for a pathologist, it's easy to tell a papilloma from a wart. It's much more difficult clinically. These are some. This one doesn't look as heavily keratinized, but uh, it looked worse in real life. Uh, it looked like it had more keratin in real life. 
And warts are just like condylomas. They're very frequently multiple. You can start out with one wart and get little satellite warts over the same area as it gets traumatized. I don't know what happened to that arrow, but ignore that arrow. But uh, there is actually a flat wart. Uh, it's mostly a skin lesion. I just happened to run into a patient and uh, reported that as, as a case of the month in the Texas Dental Journal. But this is what it looked like. It looked like somebody had been chewing on their cheek, and then back here we have almost like caviar, white caviar, just tiny little bumps, a little bit of translucent look to it. And then microscopically, that's when we found that this was classically uh, a Bruca vulgaris, but it was flattened out. And it turns out this was, I think, the fifth or sixth uh, oral flat wart that's ever been reported. So don't expect that kind of wart in your practice too, too soon. And I've already told you this is the final thing to talk about, but um, this is a, a nice thing to end up with. Um, there is a disease, and I don't know, as I said, what's happening to these white white uh, lines, but there is a disease, and about 10% of them are going to occur on the lips, usually where the skin meets the vermilion, and it looks like a little volcano is starting. And in the early times, it seems like a, a pimple, as if you, wanna, if you squeezed it, you could squeeze some of the, the uh, material out. And eventually, it looks very crusty, and uh, you can get uh, quite a buildup of this. You can get it up to half a centimeter or, or even more than a centimeter. And microscopically, it looks like, I think that was what that white part was, it looks like a volcano. You've got this hollow space just full of keratin. And pathologists are well attuned to it, but it's, it goes down deep. And the epithelium is very proliferating, even though the cells are very mature. And it can be misinterpreted as a malignancy. And because of that, some people have actually referred to this as uh, self-healing carcinoma, which is kind of, I mean, you don't get carcinomas that are self-healing, supposedly. Um, we call it super, super epithelium, I'm, I'm getting tired, pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. Epithelioma is the old word for carcinoma, and that's where the term came from. The reason I want to mention this is sometimes that keratin, well, number one, you can have, you, the pathologist can misdiagnose it, but you have to tell them this came up in a very short period of time. It got to be this size in two months, and carcinomas don't do that. It would take a year and a half or two years to get to be that size. But what is happening is something that I just reported for the first time three years ago, that Epithelium around the bisphosphonate, those open ulcers where you're looking at the bone and bisphosphonates, same kind of thing is happening. And the epithelium will actually go down and fill in the, the empty marrow spaces and will swallow up little chunks of bone. And those are features of malignancy invading into bone. So we've had four cases now. Uh, oral pathologists, it's no problem. We're used to that gingival epithelium really being proliferative. But in medical circles, they don't see that kind of thing very often. So we've had four cases that were diagnosed as squamous cell carcinoma on, of the tissue on the edge of a bisphosphonate osteonecrosis. So if you ever get a diagnosis like that, keep this disease in mind, uh, because that almost invariably has to be what it is. It's pseudo-cancer, pseudo-epithelioma hyperplasia. And I've had enough, and you've had enough, so thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.